So the Owlcast in this case. Hey, I just thought about this in this minute. I'm your host, HC, with me, Owl. Wolf. And Jaya. And welcome back to the Owl House, because finally all of Season 2 has been released. Like, how long was it ago that we did Season 1, Wolf, I think? Mm. Over two years? Yes. Yes, almost mm. exactly, yeah. Yeah, um, so it's been a while, but finally, all of this, all of season two is out. We are here. We're ready to talk about this. No spoilers yet, as, but in terms of just general thoughts, uh, Jaya, you're the guest. What well, did you first, think of season two? So first, ah, uh, I'm not allowed to be screaming, but I'm screaming on the inside because they came after the season two finale. But in all seriousness, I feel that season two was definitely very as strong as season one, expanding on the world building of the mysterious boiling isles, mm -hmm. and also and... discussing character development, growth, and nightmare fuel for a kids' show. And you mm -hmm. can tell that it was definitely the Gravity Falls crew working on this, though also subverting some of the expectations that Gravity Falls people had, like me mm -hmm. and HC. Yeah, and uh, I think on this note, I should say, I think this season was not only better than season one. Season one is still great, don't get me wrong, but I think this season not only improved on season one, but I really think it elevated Owl House to one of the best shows that's on television right now. Word on that. But on that note, don't gatekeep viewers. Yeah. If it's because it has LGBTQ rap, welcome people into the fandom and don't yeah. micromanage how they're watching the show. And we Indeed. have to say this because previous shows with LGBTQ rap and cartoons that make progress have kind of not been good at that. So let's prove mm -hmm. we're better than that. Yeah, I, you know, we'll obviously talk about the representation as we go along, but uh, Wolf, what did you think of season two? I think it was really good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, okay, we're I in just... agreement. <laughs> yeah, we are. I have really no complaints. I know from what Dana Terrace has spoken about and stuff like that, there were some things that they had to cut from season two simply because, you know, of how everything has worked out with the show, unfortunately. And they got less episodes than what they were expecting. And now with season three being cut down to what it's being cut down to. You know, I, I I know they cut some stuff, but I never felt like anything. I never felt like anything was rushed. I feel like I got all the answers I needed to from this season, with just a few questions left over that hopefully they can answer with the small amount of time they've been given with season three. We will talk about that a later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, but yeah, yeah think... overall, yeah, I'm I'm happy with this. I think it did great. I think it continued on from a very strong season one into an even stronger season two. Agreed. So, only... so uh, go, ahead. go ahead. My only disagreement in that is that nearly everyone's character arcs, both major and minor characters, wrapped up. The one that didn't was Lilith. And spoilers for season one, Lilith Vita's sister tracked with hunting her down, and Lilith did more than a few terrible things, both to Ida and to Luz, to the point that you're snickering when Hootie kicks her butt in season one, <laughs> twice. I think mm -hmm. Pika Hoot is, should have been a meme. Hootie because... in general is a meme, and we love <laughs> me. for it. He is. He's probably my favorite character because he's the unspoken MVP of the show. Hold on. Is there, any, family. is there any fan of the show who, who is not his favorite character? Apparently. Rose? Apparently there are. Because they fought some final No, no, no. No, no. I'm calling Wolf out. Wolf, I dare you to say he's not. <laughs> no comment? Oh. <laughs> Hoot -hoot. Get him. Scaredy cat. That's all I'm <laughs> I, mean, I, I think Hootie definitely won me over this season. I feel like, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, last season I remember saying he got on my nerves a little bit. There were things about him that I didn't like, and I felt like it was a little bit too much. But I think they reined him in just enough in season two, but still gave him a lot of good moments that I enjoyed him a lot more in season two. I had a lot more fun with him. 
the fact that that's Alex Hirsch, who is also king, like, mm-hmm. if you didn't and know, would you, be able to, would you be able to say that it's the same guy? It's the same voice? Probably not, if I had no. known they were the two. But Alex Hirsch mm-hmm. has great range. Yeah. He does. It... When you compare Grunkle Stan to Bill, mm. to all those voices, and he's also Grassy Knoll in Inside Job. Yeah. Um, so I think on that note, we all come down with the non spoiler part. So let's jump to the good stuff. And uh, man, that it's been a while since we did an episode by episode, I think, since either Cuphead or I think Cuphead. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Hey. Either way, and this is the point where if you haven't seen the season, you close this video, go watch it, and then come back, and you should watch it because it's an awesome season. So, yeah. spoilers are starting in three, two, one. Still here? Good. Episode, so we have episode one. By the way, I, apparently, I didn't know this was planned, but if you combine the first letters of every episode name, you get the sentence... Seek the key, fear the lock. Yeah, and that could refer to a lot of things that happened this season. Yeah, it's true. I just like that they actually, you know, put an emphasis yeah. on it. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it's a nice pairing to season one, where the first mm-hmm. letters spell out a witch loses a true way. Yeah. Which is also a nice parallel, because mm-hmm. season one ended with with Ida losing her pa- magic. Yeah. And, and then that's what I mean just... that that it's like it has a meaning in the you know in the context of the show. Um, which kind of makes me wonder what's going to happen that uh, that three you know that three lettered world in, in season three. We yeah. know it we know it can be fuck because that's four letters, but well it could be to... WTF. As in, mm. what the fuck? Yeah. Why did you take away our season? Yeah. You gave, you took away our beach really? episode. We'll get to that. <laughs> but yeah. uh, episode <laughs> one, episode one, separate tides. So, yep. well, we'll start in uh, well, season one left off. And, yep. Um, so, it's been a week since. Since Ida nearly got executed, her sister defected from the Empress Coven and is sharing the curse with her while living in the Owl House. Then she has nowhere to go and also has no powers. And Luke loses gave... station both bow- of them, the glyph, uh, you know, the glyph magic. Yeah. Yeah, but sadly, magic lessons have to wait because they do not have the muns. Luke, mm. Bello- Emperor Bellows forced Luz to give up the portal to Earth and Luz blew it up, sort of. To make sure yeah. that he wouldn't be able to use it, which, as we find mm-hmm. out in the episode, didn't work. Bellows mm-hmm. doing some fixing it that would probably make Ra- that would probably make Ra- that would probably make Nick Offerman proud. Although he probably mm-hmm. have comments on the wood, but they gotta earn money because with no door, Ida can't sell human junk from Earth or steal food for Luz. So, so there is only one. So there's only one thing you could do, and that uh, Le- Luz and King can do, and that's become pirates. Yep. So yeah. they lead us that's them to going after cute little monsters, including one that says it's rough, but that's rough, buddy. When yeah. they <laughs> overhear Ida worrying about feeding Luz, and King proceeds to push him off the statue where they're chasing him. Yeah, because you know. And speaking of that rough body, <laughs> uh, we also have an introduction to a new character who we don't <laughs> learn. The, we don't learn this in this episode, but he, later on, his his name is Hunter. We're going to call him Hunter. He's yeah. He, he and... is basically our Zuko. Wolf, yeah. Do you have anything? Do you have any objections? No. Okay. And he's or also put it, he's a bad, sad boy. But in this episode, he's just a faceless threat. Yeah. So I do. Turn- I like though. Know, can we? I just want to get out the uh, out the point where he kidnaps King and puts him in a cage. And whenever like he the, yeah, and when, whenever he removes the cloth, King is like, nye, nye, nye. he puts the cloth out. He puts he puts it. You know, he takes it out, nye, nye, and it, he covers it. That is such. A wonderful random animation moment 
<laughs> the gel is great. I, it's, King also, is it's also important because it shows that the Golden Guard isn't like Celos. Like, this, he admits mm-hmm. that King is cute. And as King says, no, I'm not. And snores. But it's mm-hmm. revealed the gold. Why is the Golden Guard important? Because he's been assigned to attack a giant seal creature called the Selkie Dumas. And he's also been assigned to find track down the Owl Lady and Luz if they're up to any funny business. Ida told Luz and King not to go on the sh- on a ship hunting for the Selkie Dumas. And we find out why later, but Luz feels guilty, thinking it's her fault they're in this situation. So she dresses up as a pirate, and King becomes her parrot, asking for crackers. And they go mm-hmm. off on a voyage. But, well, turns out the Golden Guard knew that Luz would go on the ship, and that Ida would come too, to steal the bounty money. And if I may quote Jaya when we watch this episode for the first time, are you fucking kidding me? Yes. <laughs> because the Golden Guard would rather not kill the Selkie Duma, so he basically tells them, Hunt, you hunt it for me, and I won't boil you alive in the sea, and I won't kill King. And he's like, I'm not accepting that. But Luz takes the sword that the Golden Guard summons and prepares to go kill a monster. Mm-hmm. But Ida snaps her out of it, telling her that it's not Luz's fault what happened, which is true. And pointing out that Luz saved King and Ida's lives back in the pilot from the mm-hmm. warden. And that yeah. she's not useless. Also, she will eat reveals why she didn't want this monster killed. It's a mama. It's a very mm. giant monster mama. So Luz comes mm. up with plan B. She and Ida use glyphs to fake the Selkie Dumas' death. And the Golden Guard leaves with a big bye after warning them not to cross the Emperor again. And mm. Luz sticks out her tongue at him, which looks very familiar. That's what she did with Amity back in season one. What are you implying by bringing this up? Oh, what are you, God. you should have seen the fandom. People apparently were angry. Like, no, no, right. no, Is this no, be the love no. Triangle? <laughs> I, I am, I am not opening that door. All I am going <laughs> to say now, and you but to better provide maybe. foreshadowing in the yeah. sense that Lou Amity started as a bully, as someone mm-hmm. that Lou's immediately hated on sight, mm-hmm. but somehow Lou's managed to break down her defenses. And Amity yeah. looked inward, becoming a better person. Much better, as we see in this season. Uh, we will get to Amity indeed. Um, but but uh, before as, this, I yeah, just want but, to say, as uh, you know, for this first episode, did anyone get a How to Turn Your Dragon book vibe from it? Yep. Yep. With the ice cube, Lou's making an ice boat. Mm. With yeah. hunting down the monster. And, and basically like, being blackmailed into dirty work. Also, King is like is kind of like a version of Book Toothless. Yep. Book Toothless would totally push a monster off a statue for saying that's rough, buddy. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying, or yeah. eat him. Yeah. yeah, that's the other thing. King apparently eats the bounties that are smaller than him, which mm-hmm. is how this the episode starts. And Lou's like, "No, yeah. drop it." And King yeah, just runs off playfully, I... like cat, <laughs> basically. Yeah. Uh... Wolf, you got anything to add? I mean, I, I, I've always, like, The Outhouse, I think, has a, a great amount of good background comedy, right? And I think mm-hmm. King, which it's Alex first playing King, so no surprise, right, that they would use him in this way, but he's great for background comedy. And I loved the scene with the Golden Guard playing with him and pretending he was a bird yeah. when he's not a bird at all. Mm-hmm. That was great. And again, like, just seeing the continuation here was really good in this is how Luz feels let's try and you know show her getting past that and moving forward right it was very quickly yeah. done but it, it's a very tight and it's very well done in this one episode and it makes it oh, very so enjoyable somehow, and it's a good start to the season it introduces okay, you to some new things but then finishes up and wraps up a few leftover small feelings people might have in regards to the first yeah. season there is and one new somehow, I just want to say, yeah, I just want to say that somehow Lilith and Hoodie are now besties. I don't know yeah. how they I made it that. work. I love yeah, that. Yeah, I was not expecting that. I was expecting Hoodie to remain hostile towards Lilith because he likes everybody. But it turns out he's the only one in the Owl House who likes her. Gang makes fun of the fact that she's considered a traitor now. Ida <laughs> points out she's going to be spitting up feathers because of their shared curse. And even Luz, who's normally, you know, friendly to everyone, she's like, it's 
taking a while, mm -hmm. and a video call to her mother, and which introduces King's only sad moment in this episode, where Luz promises her mother she's going to find a way home. And King yeah. grabs onto her leg and says, no, you're staying with me forever. And uh, we'll get to it, because it's, yes. it's a sad King moment now, but it's a sad moment for everyone when the season ends. Oh. No, I agree, but that is, I, that's why I wanted to bring it up, though, because it is yeah. going to come back later. And the mm -hmm. conflict, and, but fortunately or unfortunately, Luz can't send the message because with the portal destroyed, she doesn't have mm -hmm. cell service. And we can all mm -hmm. relate to that problem. Oh, yeah. We've and been some there. ending, which means her mom's going to realize she hasn't returned from camp eventually. Mm -hmm. So um, that's going to be a problem. That? Indeed, but with this we're also we're moving on to episode two, escaping yeah. explosion. So Amity is great. Yeah. Let's start with that. Amity is great. And Amity is great. And her mother is a bitch. Yeah, Odalia is the worst. And we already knew that from season one. Yeah, but because... now we have it now it's more oh. emphasized. Yep. Because this, the episode starts with Amity being target practice for one of her parents' inventions, an abomination machine called an abomaton. And Amity mm -hmm. at first is like, okay, I'll just let this bitch beat me up because it's what my parents want. But then it nearly destroys her Grom photo. And I was like, Amity, why do you have mm -hmm. that on you when you're supposed to be getting your butt kicked? And Amity hey, needs the abomaton hey, to save hey, it. She needs a good luck charm. Come on. She, she needs does, a good... but you gotta laminate that stuff. You can't keep yeah. it on you when it could get shredded, as it really is. But because mm -hmm. of that, Odalia notices the kids in the photo and schedules a meeting with Bump. Because yeah. she says Amity's grades are slipping, which as far as we know, they aren't. And the kids are a bad influence. So she has them booted out of Hexide. And no matter what the kids try to do, Bump doesn't want them expelled. He's actually crying. Mm -hmm. Way, yeah, I love that. I will say, yeah, I was about to say, Bump is like a good principal deep down. He's he's a teddy bear, mm -hmm. a teddy demon. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, remember, this is the same guy that threatened to dissect Luz, but has since uh, become one of her greatest allies. I'm here to piss here everyone off. Bump is cooler yep. Dumbledore. Well, Bump is oh. much cooler Dumbledore, <laughs> but yeah. basically, Luz, when the kids realize they, they can't them. enter Hexide, <laughs> Odali, Luz tries to confront Odalia, saying that it, Amity's a good kid and doesn't deserve this, and they don't either. So Odali's like, well, we do have a demonstration coming up, and Willow and Gus say, nope, not doing it, but then they get grounded by their parents for getting expelled. And Amity, Luz tries to talk to Amity, but Amity says her mother's not reasonable, but she'll try to figure something out to help her friends. Mm -hmm. And Luz is like, well, she seems to be a reasonable woman, and goes to agree mm -hmm. to be part of this demonstration. Mm -hmm. And she draws right. a face on the abomination butler, a kitty face. Yeah, that, that part, mm -hmm. like, you know, say what you want about, sometimes you need a Luz in your life. Just because of moments like this. And I love how they still bring that back, though. Like, it's, you know, nothing yeah. is wasted, right? And that's yep. another thing to really praise this series about. Stuff that you feel like, you know, this is just a one-off joke. Like, it, 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 there is a reason for it. Nothing is inherently wasted. There's something given to you there. It may not right. always be, like you know, apparent immediately, but it, it becomes apparent, like, oh, this is there to give you an insight into this character, potentially. And not just insight to us. The Amity comes buried in schoolwork, but finds out she's off the hook for the demonstration that night. And she sees the butler recognizing who made it into a kitty. Yeah. So she busts Gus and Willow out, realizing that Luz must have accepted the deal with her mother. And so Luz agrees to get her butt kicked, and she's like, maybe this is enough. They seem to be convinced, the audience, and Odalia's like, this isn't stopping till you're dead. Yeah, so, and that, this is the part where I'm like, okay, you know what, maybe that's the climax. Maybe they can walk things out somewhat, and then it's like, oh, it's not going to stop until you're dead. It's like, yeah, wow. Like, wow. Wow. 
And you know, you point. know something. You know something. Wolf, here's a question. If uh, if you know if one is a cooler Dumbledore, <laughs> is this is this a cooler? Is this a is this a bitchy or Lucius Malfoy? Uh. I'm a bitchier Northwest, rather. No, oh, so. um, bitchier Dolores. I I was talking about uh, Diana, his mom. Yeah, yeah, Dolores. Yeah, I know, but you know, Dolores in uh, Harry Potter, Dolores is the one that kind of you know has a conscience, you know, no, <laughs> to the, the... kind of resist. Dolores kinda... Umbridge. Yeah, Umbridge, the one who serious? takes oh, over from uh, from Dumbledore. Really? Yeah, a bitch, you're Dolores. No, <laughs> no, I, I don't see it. I don't see it. I have another character why it would fit that role actually, but mm, okay, no, we'll, we'll find out later. Not, not in this case. <laughs> Anyway, anyway, so we get to the final fight, which, by the way, it's just my head can, but I think I kind of had this, uh, th I kind of had this head can that you know, Amity started crushing on Luz before Luz started crushing on Amity, like the yeah. films are struggling on Amity's end, and I think, yeah. in, but I think in this episode is the point where Luz officially starts feeling something after Amity's Luz. Yeah. So. That's that's yeah. how I read it. Because her older siblings help the trio break into the demonstration. Because I love even the twins. they are like Yeah, yeah. the <laughs> twins are delightful chaos. And I cannot wait to see the episode where we get more depth into Edric. But mm -hmm. the problem is the guards bust Willow and Gus. So it's up to Amity to save my lose. Yeah. Get away from my lose. Eric and, oh, Amity. Yeah, the, uh, this is the point. That, um, I'm not sure. We, I, I know Jaya knows them because uh, I sent her videos of this. But like, there's, you know, there's a YouTuber. I don't. I'm not sure what her um, YouTube name is. But like, if you type "lesbian reacts," you'll find her. She has the most awesome reaction to all the Lumity stuff. Go look her up. You won't be disappointed. What a name for a show. I Respect. mean... Respect. Yeah. So, a, a reaction to that, uh, to that uh, line in particular, is like, there'll be a sign of things to come from what else comes in this season. But yeah, that, uh, that line, but yeah, that's great. Yeah. Because one could argue that Amity started having feelings for Luz after the latter tried saving her from the... Corrupted Odebin in season one. Keyword tried because Luz attempts it. It's just it just didn't go well. I think there was there was that point where in season one where she where Amity goes, okay, you're just going to the same school. No reason to worry. It's okay. That's the point. That's like the point where I think she starts feeling something. And Luz is a bit more oblivious to it, but that, but you know, that changes me with this. Yeah. But in so, any case, so Amity blackmails her parents after they blackmailed her, saying she'll tear this abomaton to pieces unless they spare Luz. <clears throat> and there's a funny moment where Luz is like, can you do that? And Amity goes, shh. But <laughs> they agree to fake their death. And the Blights agree. Alador, Odalia's husband and Amity's dad, says Luz honored the deal. Blights keep their words. So they said the kids can go back to Hexside. And then the yeah. Golden Guard appears. He's like, very nice, shiny robots you have. The Emperor yeah. wants them. Start working. Yeah. With that said, we're moving on to episode three, Echoes of the Past. And I, before we get to the King stuff, I don't know who decided that Hoodie can just detach himself from the freaking house and there are like organs inside of his usual spot. Yeah. But either give him a medal or a slap. I don't know. Whatever whatever <laughs> you feel about this. I love the comedy of it. Like they show you nothing, but you see the characters' reactions, right? And you just know yeah, like, this because... is apparently something very, very disturbing to see. <laughs> yeah it, it was i was hoping you would do the baba yaga thing again but alas <laughs> instead he's just got a very cute little portable bird house yeah both cute and gross but here's which you can event. bet 
you can bet it's an actual backpack now. People have turned this into a backpack. And I'm oh, so I'm sure. sure they have. How much would it be, though? <laughs> I I'm sure just so like... They could actually... I, do you think backpacks would be a Roars thing? Um, we could ask off mic. Um, on that case, yeah. Aurora, I'm absolutely 20, sure, right, Aurora, Aurora, 20, Aurora 22 on Instagram. Go commission her. <laughs> Indeed, she's really good. She made king and a very yeah. good king. I'm absolutely mm -hmm. sure you'll see like some very enterprising cosplayers making, you know, hoodie backpacks for cosplay and stuff like that with like mm -hmm. a hoodie that can move somewhat right and come out of oh the birdhouse God. and go back in yeah. these are cosplayers uh, who have a lot of money though i'm sure <laughs> but you might see but, some enterprising yeah. cosplay out there uh, considering Aww. you know you know i actually i've actually seen people who did who like did cosplays of like in the venom movie where like venom like partially comes out of eddie and he's like his head is like a tentacle thing i've seen people do cosplays of that so please do the same with hoodie that's all i'm saying <laughs> Also, Venom and Hoodie yeah. should be besties. No, they would be besties. I'm <laughs> scared of Hoodie. But on another note, we didn't mention that a subplot in the previous episode was Ida and Lilith doing glyph training, and this comes back here. Because Ida mm -hmm. and Lilith found out you can combine glyphs and either strengthen a spell or make new ones. And Luz reveals a new one, invisibility, for as long as you're holding yeah. your breath. Mm -hmm. So... And this will come in play for rest the rest of the season, this spell. But, yeah. mean, but for now, Tang takes the Owl House resident, San Zita, to where his castle was, which is an actual deserted island. And when Ida gets wind of it, she's like, oh, no, not again, because they took yeah. out a heart. But she follows the flying bathtub. I just want to say this is one of the most gut-wrenching, but also sweetest episodes the season it maybe is. even the show in general because yeah. like because one baby king like come on yeah. come on it's baby, baby king. king and that's dana tara's voicing baby king by the way not oh, really Irish. and she makes him really cute just like his teeth kettle scream teeth kettle he kettle scream but <laughs> it basically comes out that even though this castle is definitely real and lilith knows that none of this is in the history books King is sadly not the king of demons, and I was very disappointed because, like, oh, I thought this was going to be a Chekhov's gun that would fire. Uh, there is and... another Chekhov's gun regarding that, but again, but worry yeah, about that this bridge one got but... dispelled. Ida explains while they're running from a killer robot on the island, firing at them, that mm -hmm. she ref took refuge on the island during boiling rain, and she rescued King as a baby. Because she realized he was alone, and she thought this robot was going to murder him. Yeah. And so she didn't even know he could talk until she mentioned that him playing with his toys was like a king with his subjects. And she apologizes to King that she didn't mean to lead him on, because mm -hmm. she didn't want to break his heart, because she doesn't know who he is. Yeah. And King thinks everyone was deluding him, but Luz did, a part of Luz did at least acknowledge it could be possible. As she tells mm -hmm. Lilith at the beginning of the episode, the Boiling Isles is full of possibility. So it but also, just to yeah. say, though, the way Ida treats King, you know, when she says, I'm sorry that I didn't mean to lead you on like this and stuff, but, uh, you know, that that conversation, where I, I'm not saying this is what he intended or something, but I think this could be a good episode to maybe adopted kids. And, you know, the adopted parents talking to them about this. I think this could help. I haven't got stories, but just just a food for thought. It, it's a possibility. I mean, yeah. especially considering, you know, King does later on become a Clawthorn himself, too. Mm -hmm. Yep. That is Wait, true. But, but we do find out something. King is something. Because we find out that he was put on an altar as an egg. And when he glues his horns, he remembers someone calling him son. So he is something. And it turns out the killer robot listens to him. Its name is John Luke. And they find out he, its job is to protect King. When I was attacking Eden and King all those years ago, it basically had the same reaction she did. That an innocent baby was being put in danger. But, mm -hmm. And so John Luke, you would think would be a great ally now that they've cleared up that mess. Except John mm -hmm. Luke only works on the island. 
and takes him back to the outhouse where he goes into sleep mode. Yeah. On and... that note, just a cool fact, you know, after King glues his horn in this episode, they animate it so that he has it glued in the opening as well. Mm -hmm. They do, uh, you know, later on with Amity's hair as well. That's just a cool little detail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a very cool detail. Uh, I think because we have a lot of episodes to go through, so I think this is it for episode three. What's going to add? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Episode four. Oh, yeah. It also, Cootie is a machine gun when combined <laughs> with the right explosion. That was one of the best <laughs> banner Yeah, I like I, Again, I, I was kind of joking to Jaya when we said I get, and. Another a later episode proves that, that whenever Hoodie's like this, I'm like, so Hoodie is basically a clank. Yeah. Uh, a reference to Ratchet and Clank. To those who don't know what that game is, look it up, it's a great game. But basically, it's the same thing. He becomes a backpack and he can fly and he can be a machine gun. He's a clank. I'm not sure if Clank would like Hoodie, but that's, that's a concern for another day. Anyway, episode four, keeping up a firen, keeping up a fear, fear on it. A firen, how do you... Yep, keeping up appearances, which is where we meet the parents. Oh, that yeah. is, by the way, parents. yeah, by the way, that entrance that, <laughs> that their mother makes, like, I know it's a Miyazaki reference, but what the fuck? Good, everyone agrees. Let's move on with the episode. So, um, after I do think it was interesting because we saw Ida in the happy form. We saw Ida lose control of it, but we ne we never saw Lilith be do this before, and then it was interesting. No, I, I like this episode, right, because it, up until now, Lilith has kind of taken a back seat, and we've not seen the curse in regards to her much, if at all, up to this point. And so it's nice to see that, yes, yeah, she does have a part of the curse as well. And this does focus back on the curse, that it is still a problem. It does still exist. It's not gone away just because it's split between the two of them now. It's just now we have two people dealing with this instead of just one. And I do, you know, I didn't expect to see anything from Ida's parents or anything I, honestly i figured they would have been gone at this point but it's interesting to see them like hey we're still alive mom's still here trying to cure her daughter and you know and they and you know it is still and both of them are kind of resentful towards her like not both of them are not are not uh, fully okay with her and by the end of this lily actually wants to give her a second chance but Ida doesn't well Ida does yeah, like Ida but... does forgive her but I also, no. I, I, they I, set boundaries. Yeah, basically. yeah. Because I think it's an uneasy piece. But it's an uneasy piece. The thing is, you can't blame Ida. She's been dealing with this. Oh, well, I'm not saying that you can. And her mother but... does not understand that there isn't these cures or stamps. Like it is a pretty impressive scene that Ida sends her flying, like she's a golf ball, off into the woods, mm -hmm. and moves and eat Lilith our gap was like. Dang, lady, why weren't you going against Tiger Woods? And, yeah. But I did. The only thing, and it keeps reminding us this is all Lilith's fault. Like, because one little selfish decision led to this all expanding. Because Lilith was the one who cursed Ida, which is what led. Be and the thing is, I understand Gwendolyn's perspective is her youngest child got sick. It's a disease that turns her into a raging beast, and they don't know who caused it. Like, well, it's like I'm being neglected, and I'm like, but you could have avoided this if you had just talked to your sister and admitted what you did. Because everyone didn't tell her mother it was her fault, Lilith, this way. Yeah. Uh, well, what did you want to say, Elio? Well, I was just going to say, I felt like this episode was a little bit heavy handed in its final messaging of how. Gwendolyn sort of accepted who Ida was and that the curse was a part of her and who a part of who she is. It felt a little bit heavy handed in what they were trying to get across with this episode in terms of accepting your kids, no matter who they are, or what they are, or, you know, things of that nature, especially for, I feel like the, what seems to be a bit of like, say, you know, a coming out illusion, right? To a degree. 
I felt is a little bit heavy handed, but at times maybe you need that, right? Maybe that needs to be heavy handed yeah. considering current climate and stuff like that. I'd say considering considering it's just a line, it's not something and not a line that they repeat a lot or I I think it does its job fine, you know. I mean, it's it's I'm okay. Saying, like, no, there's nothing inherently wrong with it. It just felt to me as a, a bit of an outsider yeah. in regards to these these kind of situations, it felt a little bit forced in this situation like it didn't quite fit but they they worked it in anyways because they wanted it in yeah. which is absolutely fair nothing wrong with that whatsoever and again maybe you need stuff like that especially right now but yeah it, it doesn't take away from anything in any major way it's something that you know maybe not everyone's going to see into or read into anyways and it might fly over a lot of people's heads so that's honestly perfectly fine there are worse ways to go about doing it, and I've seen them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What that yeah, said... Because, yeah, no one acknowledges in the this episode, this is all Lilith's fault. And look, <laughs> Lilith suffers through karma. She goes full yeah. beast. Mm -hmm. After insulting King over ice cream. Yeah, like, I mean, and that's... how bad this is. It... Cootie becomes the reasonable person as King and Lilith get drunk on ice cream, which is a hilarious yeah. scene. Hey, speaking of Hoodie, you know, when Lilith decides to go with her mother at the end, and Hoodie said, well, she tells him, don't worry, we can be pen pals, and he actually goes, I don't know how to find <laughs> Yeah, Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they fortunately find a solution to that. We'll yeah, to that's... That in a bit. Yeah, but uh, just, but I just, I did some refreshing because that part. Yeah. Yeah, but right. also the episode ends with Gwen telling Lou some very important information. There was another human who came to the boiling aisles and built a portal. And uh, they, and this was the point where my I told you so to Jaya begins, but we will get to it later. Yes, yeah. He, he was he, he was right on most of his theories. And Lou also wonders how her mother's doing. Maybe her mother's missing her and is terrified. Uh, and then we cut back to the Nosteda household where her mother's crying over nature documentaries and someone hands her a, t a tissue with Luz's voice and form. And that made us all uh, stand up straight or like, what? Actually, Wolf, uh, I know what Jaya's reaction was because it was there, but kind of. But uh, Wolf, what was your reaction to seeing the couple again? My reaction was, I, 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 I go back to season one. There's like a scene where it seems like Ida's doing something to make sure it seems like Luz is at camp and everything, right? Mm -hmm. Back in season one, we see a small thing where it, it seems like Ida's sending letters to her mom or something like that. Like, hey, I'm at camp and stuff like that. So I, I, I went back to that and I figured, and my immediate reaction was, oh, okay, so this is something Ida's done. When we find out later that it's something entirely different, that's when it genuinely surprised me. I'm like, oh, okay, very interesting. Uh, because I thought it was, I thought it was Bellows. I thought it was an evil thing. That, uh, yeah. But um, well, the reason well, I was... thought it was Ida's doing because the yeah, name because of the episode, did... well, the name of the episode that we find out more is called Yesterday, Yesterday's Lie which I thought was yeah. alluding back to, you know, season one and what was done in season one. And I thought, that's extremely clever. And then we find out that it's nothing like that whatsoever. And I'm like, oh, okay, interesting. Didn't expect that. I like the way you went with this, though. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, that said, we have... <laughs> Moving on to episode five, we are through the Looking Glass Ruins. I'm not sure what book they're referencing here. Uh, yeah, so, I could imagine what. So, with that said, let, I guess talking about the Louis de Platform, it's sweet. All of it is pretty damn cool and it gives me a lot of Hilda vibes. Yeah, uh, I like it. I like it a lot. Now for the uh, now for now for Gus. Gus is great. Yes, Gus is a sweetheart, and it's nice to see we get an episode about him because he's basically the baby of the friend group. He's mm. apart from King, which is why he um, can get along so well. Yeah. But long story short, Gus becomes guilty when a trip when a magic spell injures Willow, and he, mm -hmm. he's been brought in from kids from a rival school, 
and Masala meal. Boo. They look, go to Looking Glass Ruins. And Luz is like, Masa's like, I'm useless. I just do illusions. And Luz is like, I gotcha. And she gives him enough glyphs to keep mm-hmm. him covered while she and yeah. go to the library. And for, uh, somehow the library is more dangerous than, you know, the other stuff. And it has my speak. Yeah. But Gus finds out that they're basically grave robbing. And he goes, mm-hmm. nope. Especially Would when you... a mule actually has standards and a conscience and frees him when the Glen... By the way, even, even the with a world that's inhabited by witches and all these creatures and stuff, grave robbing is still kind of fucked up. But, hey, um, they need a hobby, I guess. Indeed. So, Gus um, comes up with some pretty effing scary illusions to mm-hmm. terrify the gang. And the Keeper thanks mm-hmm. Gus as they put the, the the items back in the graveyard. Yeah. And I also think it's great that we actually got a Gus episode because... It, out of all the characters, he's the only one who didn't really have one in the previous season. So it was nice to see him get something and that he actually has some sort of development, mm-hmm. you know, throughout the season. So that was nice. <laughs> um, only really thing I want to comment on with this episode is uh, is Hannity's boss of the library. And after everything's done, it's, uh, you see him like in there, like, um, and he, well, and then it's like, Okay, you know what? I'm actually really disappointed in you. I really, I really expected more. It's, I, I, I like those mood whiplash characters mm. who start as uh, one thing and then, and then they just uh, no. Our know, house does a and... great job of like building you up to this. Okay, this is going to be really like you know, or this is going to be somewhat horror based, and you're going to be, and it's going to be kind of scary, and you know, this character is going to be like super <laughs> evil, quote unquote, and then just. Huge whiplash. No, nope, this is what they are. Why would you expect anything different? And I love yeah. that they play with this where, hey, you know, this character is going to be the exact same way and we're going to do the huge whiplash. Oh, wait, no whiplash whatsoever. It is what it is. Why would you expect anything different? Yeah. <laughs> They're really good at playing with that and knowing how to keep you off your game ever so slightly. Yeah. And then, and then we have, uh, you know, um, actually kind of... I don't know about you guys, but I think maybe I'm just, I just got used to it, but I prefer Amity with a pink hell than the green one. Yeah, I think that's what everyone seems to agree with. Pink is her color. Pink, pink purple is her color. Mm-hmm. What I do yeah. love is Luz off screen fought a literal paper dragon after <laughs> Amity got fired and explained to Malthus that it wasn't Amity's fault what happened. And yeah, so because Amity she. Yeah, because she Luz just arrives at the house and, you know, you see her all burned and beat up and she's like, there's no context. It's just like, okay, I got you your job back. Okay. Yeah. Sure. I'm so sad we didn't get to see the paper dragon at any point. I'm like, give us a dragon. Especially yeah. since the one we do see in this season is not friendly. But, yeah, uh... and, and they found out a mouse ate the journal of Philip Wittebane, the human mm-hmm. in the boiling aisle. Unfortunately, yeah. the mouse is a blue is basically a smartphone. If you tickle the cheek, it replays the contents of what it's eaten. Mm-hmm. We and we will get to it later. But for now, we have episode six, Hunting Talisman. Basically, yep. the first time we really get to dive into Hunter. And let's bring this up right now. That. The 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 scene where it seems like Luz is about is about to kiss him and then she just slaps him to wake him up. Yeah. Brilliant. A plus. But what? And... Apparently it came from the pilot. Which yeah. apparently there's a sleeping prince and she smacks him in the face. Yeah, and uh, on that note, uh, not too long ago, one of my friends was just attacking in a server like, oh, I'm so tired. Someone slapped me to wake me up, so I sent out that gift. Walks every time. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, episode, I mean, why not? Is, yeah. So this episode is Luz's identity crisis when, mm-hmm. because there's a palestrum wood shortage, thanks, fellas, uh, mm-hmm. Bat Queen helps, Bat brings her orphan talismans to Hexide and allows them to choose 
Basha's like, I don't want a secondhand talisman, but she falls in love with the bee, which is quite fitting given she is quite a bee. Yeah. And everyone else gets talisman, but Luz's goals are contradictory. She wants to be a witch, but she wants to go home. And it's not specific enough. And so she's despondent. Eden King go on a quest that we don't see. And alas, but there are fan comics on what on what happens. And in the mm-hmm. meantime, a little cardinal called Little Rascal in this episode, Flapjack and later one, sneaks into Luz's room. So she's like, I probably should get you home. And so she goes and she mm-hmm. decides slumber party with the palisman to get inspiration. Which turns mm-hmm. out to be a good thing. But how many people have did uh, have done slumber parties with random animals that appear at that window? Not recommended. And- yeah, well, maybe with plushies, perhaps, if you get a plushie slumber party. But it turns yeah. out the Golden Guard kidnaps a palisman nest with Luz inside of it. So she boots him off his ship and says, he'll be fine. And he returns and ties her up and says, I'm going to push you into the boiling sea for that. Because, like we said, Siblings. yeah. But before they can get into a fight, a dragon attacks him. Turns out the Emperor's number two, Kikimura, is jealous of Hunter and wants him dead. And Luz is like, I probably should leave him, but I can't because I'm a good person. So she smacks him awake, confiscates the staff that gives him magic, and tells him they need to move before Kikimura finds them. Uh, before you, before we continue on, uh, Wolf, I, I really wonder, what did you think about Kikimura? <laughs> Meaning, I don't know. I just think I don't. I just think she's the type of character you like, but you also hate. So I'm no, wondering I, how. I really like her, especially in this one. Like you, you know, she's very much. She takes a background role compared to I feel what her introduction was given in the first season. In the first season, we we were kind of introduced to her very close to the end, and it felt like she was going to be more of an important character than what she was. But I, I think I enjoy what they did with her, where she came became more background and you realize more and more that she's very much in it solely for the power and for, you know, gaining more power and more authority. But at the same time, she's very much no one really respects or even cares about her. And I enjoy, you know, even how they use her at the very end with... Yep the final episode like again i think they do a lot of good with kiki mora and a lot of it stays relatively in the background but you still see enough of her to know the arc she goes through right it's very enjoyable i thought i enjoyed her i liked her a lot yeah she's definitely a fun villain and it's like then i at least like her better than her character in lady manic with ladybug because in those the villains aren't competent at all Sorry, I'll take your word for it. Well, thank you, word for it. I haven't watched that. But so. Mora basically tries to hunt them down, and she doesn't know Luz is involved. So they're like, "Let's knock this bitch out and steal back the palisman." And one it of is them a moment because they dress up in hoods like Katara and Zuko from Southern mm-hmm. Raiders, so they don't get knocked out. You do mm-hmm. technically get your dragon in this episode. But it is not a nice dragon. <laughs> the paper dragon is not nicer. Uh, yeah, it's not, it's not tameable, Wolf. Come on. I mean, it's a little no, nice. They have the whistle, and it's okay, and it's cool. Yeah, but who's holding the whistle? <laughs> Fair. Very but interesting design like... for a dragon, too, considering it's all hands. Yeah. I love I... the designs in this show. I really do. Yeah, me, too. The character designs are amazing. Yeah, definitely. With that, uh, with all that said, um, so Eden, Eden can give Luz, uh, you know, a, a, pa- a palace of wood at the end so that she could cover her own talisman. This is never coming, this is only coming back once, and we don't know if she'll ever have the talisman in season three. Well, we know she will, yeah. we just don't know if it it's with her. Yeah, but and, we also but, find out the Golden Guard's name Hunter, and he doesn't have magic. But and he does get a talisman by the end of this. He does. The little cardinal flies into his room after he realizes he can't give up the palace to Bellas. 
after okay. saving his life. Yeah. And so, <clears throat> and <clears throat> and so he decides he's going to study wild magic on his own to save his uncle Bellos. And yep. Flapjack appears and cuddles him, and he's like one of those guys. You know the videos of dads that say they're never getting a cat. Mm-hmm. He's basically that. He's like, go away. Mm-hmm. But the cardinal stays like it's fine. Also, but I just want to say that Flapjack is a cute ass name, right? and it's so yeah. it's both fitting and not fitting for Hunter to come up with it. Yeah, I thought his name was Little Rascal though, so I don't know if Flapjack was the original name or if Hunter went with it. And one of the two. Anyway, episode seven, it does requiem. I probably butcher this because of the accent, but uh, yeah. Yeah. Basically what? We find out Rita's by. He does buy, which, yeah. yes. Or Pan, at least. Yeah. Uh, for one, yes. Two, we also find out that her ex partner is, you know, a non binary person, a uh, non binary witch named Rain. And yep. I like Rain enough. I think that was a good introduction for them. But later episodes make that relationship shine a lot more because. Let's say you can tell that they have those awkward excess vibes, so it's not fully yep. there yet. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, what, what do you think about Rain? No, I mean, I thought it was like, I, 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 I mean, this is entirely my fault. Like, oh, you know, I, they continued to refer to Rain by name at first, and I'm like, all right, so he, and that's what I thought. And then they slash them immediately comes out in this episode very quick. I'm like, oh, my mistake <laughs> and i love that yeah. right because you don't see a lot um, of that get done in shows and it's of, nice to see that speaking yeah. of i've i'm not entirely sure about this i'll maybe when disney plus comes out here in a few weeks i'll be able to watch this for myself and confirm. but apparently in the hebrew dub for this show they refer to rain as a he and a lot of it, and a lot of fans are actually really mad about that. I wonder if it if it's something that they fixed in later episodes, and if they went back to fix it here because that is that is pretty bad of a mistake. It's not. I mean, I, yeah. I, I don't want to assume, you know, inherent hostility from translators and stuff because it can be hard to translate. English to other languages, mm-hmm. especially because a lot of la- a lot of other languages don't have, or do have very gender specific pronouns and stuff of that nature. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Like, what's a good language? I think, like, Spanish is a very gendered language, right? And it's. Mm-hmm. I, I think yeah. they do and are starting to try and come up with less gendered pronouns, yeah. but it's a hard and one. And English is lucky that's... in that we have they slash them. Yeah, yeah like uh, actually... because I think uh, like Spanish Hebrew is a, is a, you have a lot of differences between the, between the two genders, like mm-hmm. uh, every, for every world you basically have a he and a she equivalent, so mm-hmm. right. it's, probably, and... uh, it's probably hard. I'm not going to put all the them but yeah, you, you would at least hope they would and... try to come up with something, right? <clears throat> yeah. That's fair. But Absolutely. And it happens. It's a while to find language. But the actress is Latine and non-binary. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Avi Rock. So... Yeah, so that, that's cool that they, you know, kept someone. It, it, that, you know, yeah. They cast someone who is also non-binary because, you know... Yeah. It helps. Yeah, I, and for what it's worth, I I think everyone was worried that this was just going to be one a one scene character that Rain would just appear once and then would vanish. Especially how the episode ends. And fortunately, that is not what happened. Hmm. We all thought that was what was going to happen, but no, Rain does come back later. Because I will say that a lot of people were actually surprised that they come back. A little in the next episode. Well, Rin comes back in flashback, but in the present. Still. And but, so, uh, yeah. But the reason why they reconciled is basically Ida's drowning her sorrows in an apple blood juice box. 
when she thinks that Ida and King, Iluz and King are going to leave her soon. King, because he has, wants to tell her something important, and Luz, because they're going to be participating in a flying race. And while she's in town, she helps a resistance group called the Bards Against the Throne. And it turns out Rain is the leader, but they hate being the leader, actually. They hate doing speeches and being in public, being around people. And Which when Ida's like, what are you the... doing? <laughs> it's a big mood. I would, too, and if I came up with like... such terrible names. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, the best is awesome. You know, and, and you know, that, that is probably Rain's biggest weakness, you know, just terrible names. They it don't like terrible long. names. Yeah. But, it, but yeah, in any case, and one funny scene is he just like, what the hell are you doing, Rain? And Rain seems to be mad. And Rain then blushes and says, you're embarrassing me in front of, you're making me blush in front of everyone. And he is like, you, I don't look cool. And he's like, what are you talking about? You're cool. Mm-hmm. And you're very cool. And so Ida joins the resistance, even though she has no powers, because because she's a criminal and has been for uh, 20 years. She can help them evacuate wild witches, which they do. Something very important we find out later. Yeah. And to sabotage emperor supplies. The problem is they're using insider information from Rain. Which makes the rest of the Covenhead suspicious. There is an imposter in our midst. I love how the- they slowly introduce you to a couple of the Covenheads. And you, you learn just how strong the Covenheads are, right? And why they have yeah. their position. Right? They do extremely well in really setting them apart more often than not. Yep. Mm-hmm. And it's only so- a, a few select ones that you even get introduced to. It's really well done. Right. Yeah. We meet Everwolf and Darius, who set a trap for the bats. And Eden uh, Rain know- and Eden Rain knows about the Day of Unity. O- nothing about the Day of Unity. Only that requires the Coven Heads. And Eda's curse causes everything to shrivel if she plays music. So they start playing a heartbreaking duet as a suicide mission to take out the Coven three Coven Heads at once, including Rain. And re- they're dying, but then. A photo flies out. Mm-hmm. And Rain's like, wait, you have a family and you didn't tell me? Yeah, that's uh, that's something. And, you and know, it's-, uh, it, it's, it's one of those, you know, it, it didn't really come up, but at the same time, you also kind of understand that it might it might hurt them that like yeah you moved on with a, with a different kind of family and like uh, but uh, it's also like rain is also realizing Ida's suicidal because mm-hmm. they both know they're not gonna live so she's they stop the first music and run for it and yeah. we find out Ida and Rain's mutual flaw they're martyrs to the point of extremism. Mm-hmm. In the, and so Rain pulls a sacrifice to help Ida escape, saying that go back to your kids, I'll be fine. And Rain That's is freaking... Ida is close to tears as she's forced to leave. Where and she where she finds out that King wants Ida to adopt him formally. Mm-hmm. And, and then uh, and God. then you know King actually streams a message to wherever his father is, and. Yeah, there's someone. There's someone watching. Who looks like King? Indeed. And sounds uh, like Shudder. Yeah. Yep, definitely sounds like the Shudder. Uh, so, but I then guess... in the meantime, Rain is facing. In the meantime, a captive Rain is prepared to be turned to stone. And King and Mora's like, "Yeah, no, bitch, that's not happening." <laughs> Rather, no, B, that's not happening, and uses the co uses the Coven sigil to knock out Rain for the Day of Unity, saying they need to only really be alive long enough for that. So that's something interesting to know. Coven sigils can restrain a person, as it turns out, which up. makes Velos look even more insidious than he is, and that the Coven heads need to be alive for the Day of Unity. Yep. Well, when so that's, that's said, where the episode ends. Then we go to a <laughs> semi breather episode. Uh, we go to episode eight and knock, knock, knocking on Hoodie's door. Um, 
Can we yep. agree this is the best episode? I think we can agree. It is this definitely the, the funniest. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, well, it's absolutely the funniest, but it's also really great in how it pushes forward a lot of different plot lines that were like, you know, they're not the main plot line, but it pushes forward every single character's plot line here in a really enjoyable way for it to be kind of like, hey, this is our pullback episode from all of the um, plot that we've been giving you, but we're still giving you something that pushes everything forward and moves everything forward just in a very different way. I very much enjoyed this one. Um, so Frank and Hootie Wong, is like Frank... best wingman. Yeah. Uh, well, the... <laughs> Frank, <laughs> honestly, I, honestly, before the Lumity stuff, I think my favorite part in this episode is when he's trying to help King figure out who he is. And just King does this that this dance for no reason. He just does this dance and for and then who this response is, don't you talk about my mother? <laughs> <laughs> Which I have questioned, who do you have a mother? One and how does he have a mother? How was this thing? He doesn't have any organs. Even how how was this even how was this thing pushed out of a womb? That's what I want to fucking know. Two, or how did he hatch out of an egg? His beak is yeah, not sharp. Yeah. Two, what the hell does this then say about mothers? Three, I don't know. I don't Listen, know three, but like... <laughs> you, you, you don't question Hootie. Yeah. I guess I don't. He just is. <laughs> On that note, Hootie figured out how to write to Lilith. He is the talking typewriter from the book episode. Yeah. And so he realizes everyone's dealing with their problems. King doesn't know who he is. He is powerless in dealing with trying to stay awake because she's worried about her Albie script acting up. Mm -hmm. And Luz is about torn between working with the Echo Mouse, which Hootie swallows, bad Hootie, yeah. <laughs> and asking out, and asking out Amity, even though she's and she's starting to realize she has feelings for her classmate. And Hootie gets a work book on his face. It's not necessarily... I would say it's not necessarily that she needs to make a choice between the two. It's um, between asking Amity out. It's more that she knows that if she's using this this mouse thing, then she's going to lose some credit. She's going to lose some credit with Amity. But... Well, no. Yeah. She's keeping the mouse, but Hootie ate it, so I think that's a very traumatized mouse after it comes in out of yeah. the back. And, and then, I screamed and, when that happened. I'm like, no! Yeah, I remember that. But the thing is, so, then we have then we have Hootie doing doing the best face in animation history, realizing uh -huh. that he can help all of them. King, King and all of them can kind of be summed up to he thinks he fails, but he actually didn't. He he succeeds in his in a, his very own special way. <laughs> yeah. Um, and by uh, by the way, I don't. The only thing I'll say about Ida is that one health flashback so freaking hot when I got wrenching for one, but two, I like that she has this healthy mode now that she can actually that she can kind of control. And at first she's shocked about when it's like. Damn, I'm actually looking good. Yeah. Which, which yeah, it's a cool design, so well, I, she's not wrong. I love that they show, right, you know, the owl beast. Like, <laughs> they give you this, what feels like vague backstory for the owl beast itself, for the curse itself, how it seems like this creature doesn't want to be trapped with Ida, but is trapped with Ida because it was trapped in a in a scroll apparently and that's how it became the curse yeah. and you know you mm -hmm. see that red thread connecting them and you see right how it feels like you know the owl you know the creature doesn't want to be there it wants to be free to do what it wants to do but it can't like i i love that it feels like it's very much a vague backstory. Whether it is or isn't, I can't tell you, but it very much feels that way. It feels like, hey, here's a little yeah. bit of how this, you know, creature came to be in the position it's in and how it's not necessarily evil per se. Mm -hmm. And yeah. my guess, I, and I'll say this, yeah. I am happy that Lumity happens and it's a great yeah. way it happened, but 
question. How did Hoodie abduct Amity into a bag? I have the costumes of- and put her in an <laughs> owl palace. I mean, he ate her. That actually is worse. That's what you know. Something I'm. I'm sorry. I asked. I shouldn't have. It's creepy. I mean, the owl pellets only yeah. come from one thing. So Hootie had to have eaten her. And we want to talk about the mouse being um, traumatized. <laughs> actually, speaking yes. of traumatized, speaking of traumatized, time time for some uh, time for some out of out of context questions. Jaya, what yes. is creepier, a tunnel of love by Hootie or the Garfield one? Go. Out of love, love by Yuri because the Garfield one is defunct. But I mean, granted, no one, at least we can say in that tunnel, Hootie's tunnel of love, no one fucked there in the middle of the cameras in front of Garfield. Uh, on that note, plugging defunct Lane, go watch that video, people. Yeah. And I'm um, like, people are messed up because there are people who have told yeah. stories of how many times they've had sex on a tunnel of love less than four minutes. And I'm like, what is wrong with you people? There are cameras. You know, I think I think Wolf now has a more shocked face than both of us did when we found out about I'm him. Not, because he has I'm no not surprised. Him. People are animals. <laughs> how, how, I'm not surprised. I, I people mean, are I, animals. <laughs> but four minutes is not... I mean, some of my friends who told me this, four minutes is not enough. But at least in Hooties, Amity loses Before, two minutes to get any ideas. But basically, if they go on a date in the human teenagers. world, no tunnel of love. Here's an interesting thing. This also introduces a new character, the Collector. It's a mysterious yeah, being that captured the Owl Beast. And I'm sure we'll never see him or her again. Nope, not at all. Please but also, we learn nope. King is a demon, but we don't know who or what he is. Mm-hmm. And let's hope that um, Blood Temple never gets found by the Emperor's Coven. Yeah, and and just to really close the Lumity part uh, real quick, I'll say, you know, that one, I'm glad that we actually got them dating in the middle of the show and they didn't just yeah. stay till the end. And yeah. two, God, God damn it, that asking out in is the, like, the cutest thing ever and it's relatable. <laughs> Hootie, yep. no. Hootie's tantrum also, making a heart and and Ida and King being back like, well done, Hootie. <laughs> Clever. <laughs> yeah. And, and, yeah, and it all comes down because he just has a panic, a, a crying attack on the top of the now, As he's summing up in his success story to Lilith, a certain person comes by to give King a message. And yep. he needs it. Yes. And we're like, Hootie, you had one job. Yeah, like, it's like, oh, a does... bug. <laughs> it, it's like, Hootie. You, whole... you win some, you lose some with him. He can't win them all. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, moving on to episode nine, Eclipse Lake. Yeah. This is a really good one. <laughs> this, is an, and, this is a great episode. And the Avatar vibes are strong in here. Yeah. Also, the fact that Mae Whitman once again water bends. Yeah, that's I think that's one the one thing everyone brought up that like uh, like how Katara has this water pod with her, so Amity has this thing to keep uh, abominations with her whenever she needs it, which is cool. And it's a good thing she did. So this time, Ida and Amity are going on a girls' trip because Luz is sick. Yeah. And. Uh, by the way, by the way, by the way, I just have to mention Ida trying to practice her transformation by 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 watching ba- Dragon Ball, where all they do is scream. So she's trying to scream as well. I mean, that is that is top tier parody. <laughs> that was extreme tongue in cheek, tongue in cheek wink. Hey, you remember our, our finale for the final season and how all that looked very anime? Wink, wink. You know, yeah. wink, wink. <laughs> like yeah, I see you, I like show. How, I get it. And I like how Emily points out, like, "Ooh, this is this is this looks ancient." And uh, it is like, "What do you mean? Tell the years? I've never seen this in theaters." And it's like, yeah, thanks for reminding us. I saw Pokemon the first movie in theaters. Mm. So. I did too. Feeling old. But in any case, Gus and Willow agree to play babysitter to lose who wants to go to Eclipse Lake. And they find that she's what? surprisingly strong despite being sick. 
And by the way, something. you would you would expect that Luz would teach Hannity how, how to read those texts earlier. On a Tamagotchi. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Luz, so Ida still has some human junk, and she has little Tamagotchi things, or rather, not Tamagotchis. And Hannity's not used to the girlfriend thing, so she thinks Luz is just giving her orders. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, I gotta be an awesome girlfriend. I gotta do whatever Luz says. Which, and Luz gives a very adorably confused face at this. Yeah. But, I and like, Luz, though, when they come back and she actually tells her, I, I'm just happy that my super awesome girlfriend is okay. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and funnily enough, it's King that real makes Amity realize, dude, she's not ordering you around. He turns it sideways, and it's revealed to be yeah. a bunch of compliments. Mm-hmm. And Amity's like, I am so dumb. Why am I being dumb around Luz? But, but in any case, yeah, it's, it it's, I, I love how her immediate reaction is yes. it's literally Luz. Why would I think it would be anything else? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, because Luz was trying to eat the portal key, which is all she has from the portal, Amity confiscates it and puts it around her neck. And she, and so they're going to go to Eclipse Lake to find Titan's Wood to build another portal using Philip Wood and Bane's journals, or rather the mouse. Which leads to, I like Luz's little mouse song. She goes, bloop, little Elka mouse, bloop, bloop, bloop. And the mouse is just, okay. <laughs> and, but uh, on the journey itself, I think one of the best action sequences in the show, really, like uh, all the fight scenes are wow, <laughs> beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Turns out, turns out the Emperor is also sending people to Eclipse Lake. He advises Hunter to sit out of this mission because it's dangerous and says, you still have a part to play in the Day of Unity. And Hunter thinks like, oh my god, I'm gonna get replaced. So he ditches his cape for an Emperor's Coven disguise and prepares to follow along as Kikimura's assigned to get Titan's blood. But he gets busted because he opens his mouth. Of course. Again, oh. and, and like the Zuko vibes. Not even <laughs> it's so the... strong. Because <laughs> King of was like, I like... recognize that annoying voice anywhere. Yeah. And blast him <laughs> into a tree. Right in the path of Ida, Ida, Amity, and King. And he's like, I, he pretends to surrender, and he's like, I recognize that voice, and attacks him. So, it is one of the funniest moments when Ida and Kikimori come to agree on something. Hunter's voice is annoying. The only, Uh, like, issue I have with Eclipse Lake is going back after future revelations that you have about the Emperor, it it just feels odd that he would send people here knowing that it's more or less a dead end. Well, maybe that's why he said Kikimori, because he he got annoyed that she survived. True. Yeah. True. <laughs> and that's it is Kikimura that he go. sends here. True. Well, yeah. This is basically a snipe hunt because he knows there's no Titan's blood here. And in the meantime, Amity ties up Hunter because she found out from Ida that he tried boiling her girlfriend alive. Yeah. And Hunter is very annoyed. Is more annoyed by the fact that we described him as a bad, bad boy, and he starts angrily <laughs> muttering. But I mean, he just proves the point, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so to get uh, free, he keeps telling of... Amity that Luz is one and he doesn't think she's an awesome girlfriend and is ordering her around. Uh, Which is yeah. hilarious. Their dynamic is just great. Yeah. Amity's trying uh, to by remember. The way, by the way, speaking of the fact that uh, Amity is voiced by my Whitman and that we call uh, him the boss of the Zuko mission. I'm so glad that, you know, when they actually meet, there is no way people are going to take this into the shipping route, although I'm sure people did, but still. People will ship anything, HC. I know, but here at least there are more more limitations, that's all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, well, Kudi and Duolingo, both Duolingo and Dana Terrace said that that would probably be canon if they did a crossover. Yeah. Anyway. That being said, moving on to, you know, speaking of Hunter being a sad boy, all of <laughs> us were sad people after we saw yesterday's live. So, yep. 
And this before was the episode we get, before the hiatus. Before, before oh. we get to that, though, there is a there is a funny story I want to share with the audience, and I'm by extension you. Mm-hmm. So Jay and I are watching this, and we come across this character called Jacob. Apparently, his name is Jacob. Who's hunting the, you know, who's trying to prove the witch world exists. Yeah. As soon as he shows up, I'm like, his voice sounds familiar. I've heard that voice before, and I can't put my finger on it. But as the show goes on, and he keeps talking more and more, and so, and the voice until kind of slides into it at some point. I'm like, I know that fucking voice. It's Sonic the Hedgehog. And <laughs> Kaya goes, are you fucking kidding me? And that is yeah. the best, and that was the best reaction I could hear to anyone realizing that they casted Sonic the Hedgehog as a bad guy. Also, Roger Craig yeah. Smith is awesome. <laughs> yes, he is. I mean, oh, and- Sonic is terrible, so it's understandable. Oh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Sonic 2006 was bad. Uh, it was yeah, so... but it's not but it's not Sonic himself. Uh, that's, that's discussion for another to... day. <laughs> he was basically Reeve Carney and Patrick Page trying to save Turn Off the Dark, but they could not fight the cardboard camera. Yeah, I, although, you know, it's not the same voice actor in 06. That was before Roger Jackson was Yeah, him, but Oh, anyway, bas- to the episode. Basically, yeah. So, in the previous episode, Amity and Hunter realized that the portal key had tightened on it, making their whole trip useless. So, Amity surrenders the key, but got some blood on her glove, which the Owl House residents used to make a makeshift portal. But Ida, of course, ties Relu's with a safety rope, because she knows how these things go in human movies. You need a safety yeah. line. And Luz um, ends up uh, in this weird space in between uh, Earth. By the way, I like how she has a way to apparently to kind of spy on Emily's house, and she's actually respecting Emily's boundaries. That's actually, that, you know, it's just a quick throwaway line, but it's cute. I like it. Mm. It is. And so Luz finds out she can spy on both Earth and the Owl House, where she sees herself dressed in very different clothes and talking to her mother. And she's like, oh, no, bitch, who are you? And they start uh, to fight through the mirror. I, I like and, how there's the point where you can tell her Luz's mother is like, you lose something, okay? And Luz just goes, yes, ma- yes, mama, just for the spoiler for this, uh, for this not my hero academia. And her mother's like, I never get it. <laughs> Even those of yeah. us who like to watch anime sometimes never get it, so I understand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, to be fair, my humor academia is super long. I've only read volume mm. one, and I'm like, do I want to emotionally invest myself in this pain for seven? I've years seen two. No I've seen life? two episodes. I've seen two episodes, and it yeah, is that's not going anywhere. <laughs> quite good, but, but long, in any yes. case, Luz and this girl call truth because they realize that neither of them are really hateful, and Luz doesn't hate anyone. So it turns out this girl is a basilisk named V. Similar to the basilisk from season one, only she's not bad. Yeah. As V explains, she bellows brought back the basilisk from extinction and experimented on them. V ran away due to chance luck. And the day that Ida basically forced Luz to serve as an errand girl, she slipped through the portal and she took the form of the only human she saw. Just as Dr. Noceda came running from the bus stop. Because, turns out, Dr. Noceva felt guilty about leaving Luz alone to go to reform camp. Came back to the stop and realized her daughter wasn't there, so she was terrified. She goes along with it and went to camp. So that's who was sending the letters and who was offering the tissues. Yeah. And we get reminded, and V actually doesn't understand why Luz left. Because she said, mm-hmm. you left your mother, what were you thinking? Mm-hmm. So and I that's... Like that you know that instead of a rivalry, they are actually developing a friendship with each other, and they help each other. And essentially, when Camilla finds out, she's not mad at V. On the contrary, she's welcoming her to stay, which is really yeah. fun, which I really like. But I also like how Camilla is just oblivious to the whole thing, and she thinks there's a prank going on. Until yeah, she because... sees how Jacob, how crazy Jacob is. 
Yeah, but to be fair, she said Luz makes up these stories all the time, so she just plays along with it. Which actually might explain how Luz ended up in the principal's office way back in the first season. Yeah. And, but then we see where Luz got her fiery spirit from. Because mm-hmm. when Dr. Nocera takes off her chancla, her sandal, and kicks Jacob's butt to save V. And yeah. later she tells V, you don't have to hide from me. And gives her, because V can only be shapeshift if she has magic. And thanks mm-hmm. to the portal being destroyed, there's limited sources. So Luz mm-hmm. helps her find... Lita's ex Hexus Hold'em cards. Who knew that Chekhov's gun would come back? Because Ida ditched them on Earth while trying to use them and, to pay for stuff. And apparently, yeah, uh, and I'm not sure about the actual hints, but people say that this episode contains a lot more hints to the fact that Ida might be Stan's ex wife. Well, yeah, because she used the name Marilyn. I was like, I knew it. I was like, yes, I knew that Stan married Ida because who else would be able to con him? Um, that will be an interesting yeah. threesome. That's all I'm gonna say. But um, only a con can but, con another con. I'm gonna write. I'm totally gonna write that fic where it turns out <laughs> Stan's been using the mystery mailbox to write to Marilyn, at inviting her to Thanksgiving. And she finally mm-hmm. shows up the year the letter didn't arrive because Babel mm-hmm. accidentally got the mailbox blown up. Yeah. I'm going to write rain. that one day. She shows, up, she shows up with rain. And she's like, and this is all very awkward but very wholesome at the same time. Yeah. As, because she realized Maybe. something must have happened if her ex hadn't stopped sending her letters. Yeah. And meanwhile... So, Meanwhile, but yeah, meanwhile, the... yeah. So, uh, Camila, been... Dr. Noceda finds out Luz was lying to her for months. And the portal starts collapsing in this beautiful scene. One of my favorite scenes from the show, where Luz becomes invisible through the rainstorm. But Camilla yeah. can't touch her. But she still tries to hold on to her daughter anyway, as the Cowhouse yeah. House residents have to pull Luz out of the portal. Mm-hmm. And Dr. Noceda due to miscommunication, thinks that Luz ran away from her to pursue a witch fantasy. Because there's no time yeah. to explain Bellos and the door and because all that. she actually asks us, so wait, you willingly ran away from me. Am I, uh, like, was I, did you really suffer with me that much? And that's like, ouch. And yes, and Luz is obviously trying to explain, but then the portal collapses. And it's like, actually, no, an emperor blackmailed me. And the choice was either give him the portal and have him potentially endanger you, or stay in the boiling aisles and fight him. Yeah. Because if, if there's no time, though they fortunately get rectified later. But for now, Dr. Noceda asks Luz to come back and stay. She'll make things better. And Luz, mm-hmm. knowing she's not going to see her mother for a long time, promises. And she comes back and, and that, says, I'm going to introduce you to, she said my mom wants to meet you guys. And she plans to introduce them. So she's going to keep her promise. The, and, and then the hiatus happened. Will, yep, and then hiatus happened. <laughs> A lot of I, stuff happened in the hi- fucking hiatus. But then we got episode, we got episode 11 from oh, 30 in oh. general. Molly's at the Coven Day Parade. I mean, just just going back, like I loved the way they played Luz's mom, Camila, in that final mm-hmm. scene of episode 11, of episode ten. It's it's extremely well done. I love how you know it's still her not quite getting or understanding who her daughter is and what she enjoys and everything, and why she enjoys yeah. those things. Right? I love how they still play her that way because she wouldn't get it yet hmm. because they've not had that chance to sit down and talk. The only problem I have with episode 10 is how they make Luz very much seem like the bad guy for wanting to get away from her mother, for wanting to leave. Because, oh, your mother's so good. You have this mom. You have family. Why would you ever? And I I, I get it. That's how V would see things. But it, it's yeah, a shame yeah. because we right. never get to hear or see at least some semblance of Luz's side of things where... You know, Luz did have good reason to feel the way she felt, right? And it's because her mother didn't believe in her. Her mother didn't really... Her mother humored her. It wasn't her mother. It wasn't her mother, though. Luz's plan was stay for the summer and then come back in the fall, having fulfilled her dreams. She was planning Mm -hmm. to keep this her secret adventure. 
It's just yeah. always fucked that up. Absolutely, but and, you know, again, like her mother was trying to get her to just be normal, quote unquote, right? And you know, that was the disconnect between them, and that's what kind of started everything and Luz's whole journey, right? And yeah. Luz didn't... to an extent, the issue was Luz was in danger of being expelled due to her pranks, and Absolutely. so Camila was kind of at the end of her wits. Mm-hmm. So she was trying to keep her daughter from being expelled and decided I mean, to go with this. I mean, you, and the thing is, though, and maybe maybe Linda will find out, but there's also this thing that, you know, we most, when from what we see of Camilla before, the, before this episode, we don't really know much, just from the fact that she wants her daughter to do well in school and, you know, be social and stuff, because I think she's acting more out of concern for Luz, but oh, absolutely. Like, as far as I remember, me... I, 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 as far as I, but the thing is that as far as I remember from episode <laughs> one, and I know this for my for myself that you know my my parents uh, my parents uh, did have some things about oh he doesn't necessarily he's not into what other people are into you know being yeah. being being an out being an outcast is kind of a thing. Like, and parents don't really know why. It's not necessarily why you... And sometimes it, it can really come down to those little things of you like something that the others don't. And that mm-hmm. cause problems when you're trying to make well, friends. Well, it's... But, like, Luz and Camilla's biggest problem is the lack of communication, right? How they don't right, just sit yeah. down and talk. And I love that that still is the problem. Although here, it's not so much either of them refusing to do so, it's that they're not given the chance to do so yet. And I love that that's, that's how true. they continue forward, right? And that that still is the problem of Luz doesn't know how to feel. She wants to make her mom happy. She wants to be there for her mom and do the things she promises her she'll do, but she also wants what she wants too. And, it's, and they weren't able to communicate that with one another because they weren't given the time. And that right. becomes a major problem for Luz. My issue was, right. you know, at the beginning that was established too in season one as the disconnect between the two of them and why they, you know, couldn't quite see eye to eye and why one wanted one thing and one wanted another. And to have V come in and say, you know, you had it so great, you don't get it. And Luz right. does and get it. To... But at the same yeah. time, right, it's very much a thing of this could come back in season place. three considering how that season two ends that we'll get a little bit more of this and get to go into this more and see more of Luz's side i hope even if only just a little bit of it to give that kind of clarification that l- neither person is the bad guy in the relationship here right like no, neither camilla no. nor Luz are you know awful for making the choices they make they both just you know i it, like the, the problem here is they just don't communicate their feelings very well yeah. with one another and what they're thinking and what they see things. And hopefully, right. you know, season three will get at least some kind of quick rundown with them finally being able to just sit down and communicate. Right. I mean, Liz is going to have to tell her mother everything at the end of this. And that's what she yeah. plans to do. And so, but, uh, but obviously, we'll... we'll get to that, though. Like, I know we're saying a lot of we'll get to that. But that's so anyway. That's uh, part of the course. But uh, for now, fall is at the Coven Day Parade, and yes, uh, because because uh, Jaya would kill me if I'm not going to bring this up. How did we go from this emotional moment with Luz and her mother? <laughs> the next thing you see afterward is Hoodish dead in his skin. Yo, God, yes. So Luz is trying to record a video to convince her mother that the Boiling Isles is an evil, but no one is helping her case. Hootie is drying his skin off the fucking laundry and <laughs> even causing nightmare fetish at Luz to freak out. Bump shows mm-hmm. off the new detention rooms. Things you don't want to show. Like, he's trying. But Luz is like, if a blob that's swallowing a, te- a student begging for mercy is not going to convince her. Yeah. And basically, she's worried this isn't going right. And she told King and Ida what happened. And Ida's like, people can change their minds, you know. And King points out she hasn't even met me yet, and I'm very persuasive. But she hasn't told Amity, Gus, or Willow. And, and yeah. she lies to them that she the portal and, t- didn't go well, which isn't um, a lie, but drops and, her uh, phone. You can, you can tell that she's just not sure how to bring this up, but Emily's concerned yeah. when she sees the phone. 
Uh, yeah, because we've never dropped uh, your can, phone. Can we just bring up the fact that Rain, <laughs> that in the plane to Rain, that little that song thing actually became a freaking meme, and I oh, both love and hate it. Yes. So Rain is back. And apparently okay, just a little mind-wiped and suffering headaches, saying they had gaps in their memory, which isn't suspicious at all. But she and Kikamura have a bonding moment where they talk about how they hate people and shiver. Like, wait, did you just actually make the most hateful villain sympathetic in this show? Yeah. Okay, people. <laughs> but Somehow. King reveals... But while they're discussing this, King reveals that Ida's interested in the parade because he read her diary. And all about Rain and her starting a resistance. And he's like pointing out, but did you read the part where Rain got captured sacrificing themselves for me? And King's like, I stopped. And Luz collapses with a big squee face. And he was like, you broke Luz. So, <laughs> and so this is all hilarious. And then they see Kick and Mora crying. And he's like, nope, leave her. Leave her. And he's reaching then, out to her. And, and finds I out there's a family reunion in Kikamura's family the day of the festival. If she leaves, she'll probably be fired. But if she stays, she'll be disowned. And feeling bad about her own dilemma, Lou says, how about a leave to a temporary truce? You help Ida talk to Rain, and I'll pretend to kidnap you so you can make it to the reunion and come back with an awesome cover story. And much to everyone's shock, Kikamura agrees. Mm-hmm. And we get uh, the best destruction ever, which is King and Hoodie operating yes. freaking, a freaking a parade float because yeah. there's this uh, distraction. And at first, I was like, this is not going to go well. Mm. But then, surprisingly, <laughs> their part of the plan goes off without a hitch. Seeing Hootie running around, I am your god now. <laughs> Just, oh my god, that was so good. I loved that scene. I Those love poor that guards. because he wasn't even full hootie, but he sent the Empress Coven running. It's Those a freaking poor guards. parade float. <laughs> I mean, I feel bad for them, but that. Yeah. I mean, to be fair, they, I mean, <laughs> they unlocked his bill cipher. Two bill ciphers in one. But the other parts don't go well. Ida tries to talk to Rain. Rain says they haven't talked in years, confusing Ida, and forces her to run, saying that the Emperor's Coven is coming. And even tell makes Ida turn invisible to protect her. And Kikimura and see, and Amity notices, recognizes Luz's voice and bad acting when kidnapping Kikimura and gets a very epic face palm yeah. following them. And another person mm -hmm. falls, and new character Tara has a plant coven. And Tara nearly impales an invisible Luz and Kikimura while talking about a promotion. So Kikimura turns on Luz just as the latter transports her to a dragon and tries murdering her for that promotion. And yeah. just as she has Luz and Amity on the ropes, Tara saves them. Hey, that you're gonna start a riot, lady, and your promotion is you're not dead. Yeah. Which, and honestly, it's such a bitchy thing to say, but it's a good ass line. I mean, it, it works for the character they give us Tara, and it also works for Kikimura that she thought she was getting more power and she's instantly on board again. And then immediately just, they crush her hopes. <laughs> I feel for you, but you deserve it. <laughs> I think the really last thing I have to say regarding this episode is that they lose an Amity coin and try to for me. Global. And yes, because Amity's yeah. been teaching herself Spanish and yeah. got it from a cookbook. And Luz is like, you are so cute. I am... <laughs> Which is so cute. Yep, yeah, that is that's great. And I don't. Uh, the rest of the episode you kind of summed up. So I think moving on. To yeah, the there is one thing Kara says that confuses Kate Ida. It's that confuses everyone. She says the Emperor's looking forward to meeting you for the first time. Yeah. Well, like, to meeting you what? again, isn't it? Well, meeting no. She says where the Emperor looks forward to meeting you for the first time. Oh, okay. Which confuses Amity because she knows about the encounter, Luz had. She says, but you already met Bellos. How could you meet him for the first time? And they watch as Bellos announces the day of meeting. The crowds are cheering him. Ida's yeah. crying about what happened with Rain, but says it's okay. He tried, and we'll wait for what's coming. As Amity and Luz share a very cute hug. 
<clears throat> which leads us to episode 12, Elsewhere and Elsewhen. No, right, Giano, yeah, no, I'm not yet going to let it go. I call yes, it. You were right. I called it. Yes, you called it. Because hey, because HC's theory was Philip Whitman was Emperor Bellus, as most of the fandom theorized. I'm like, but that doesn't make sense. Bellus came into power 50 years ago, or like a few years ago. Philip was from the colonial times. How does that make sense with the timeline? And also, if he was a human talking about building a portal, and the portal's there, he probably went home his Grunkle Ford thing, but couldn't get grant money because grants didn't exist at King's College in the time period. Nope. He was right. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Philip Wittebank, the human that wrote a journal and did the Grunkle Ford thing from Gravity Falls, is Bellows. If I may quote Cadicus, I'm a genius. You are. Mm -hmm. The only time I'm going to say this about myself, (laughs) but anyway... Um, so, besides, so yeah. besides the shocking revelation, I like this episode for like uh, because I never expected it to be like a full episode dedicated to like Luz and Lilith bonding with each other and going on an adventure together. But it was good. I enjoyed it. No, it works yeah, really so great for both. On of them. one hand, on one hand, it's a girls' trip. After Hootie throws a party because Lilith found a new job that she loves and doesn't involve backstabbing people or cursing her sister. He starts feeling inadequate when an, another explorer, which explorer, reminds her to clear out her desk at the Emperor's Coven. And feeling bad, they, she says she would like to do design and exhibit, but lacks ideas, worry that she's boring. And But Ida says, and Ida mentions that they could go on a time travel trip, which if they use one of the fingers from Amity's glove with Titan's blood, so Luz is like, girl's trip! But Ida stays at home to avoid her parents and sends Lilith out, ordering her not to let anything happen to Luz. And King stays yeah. at home to provide emotional support to Ida because her dad's coming and she doesn't want to mm-hmm. see him. So Lilith and mm-hmm. Luz go to the Dead Wardian era where Philip Wittenbane lived. They hide their ears and Luz announces, Yes, I am a crab maiden <laughs> when someone asks her. So oh, it's human, yeah. oh, you know, human friends. I do <laughs> I do love how this show continues to kind of like you go for so many episodes, right? Of this of, of season two where the Emperor could come in and stop all of them and take all of them down and everything, and they never do it, and you're always left wondering why, right? Yep. And this episode is the first little hint of that reasoning, right? And then they slowly reveal more and more, this is why the Emperor did what he did and never bothered to deal with them until he chose to deal with them. Like, it's it's so well done because you're always feeling like, why? And it's so nice that they wrap that up in a nice little package like this. Agree, and I agree. My theory was that Luz needed to be alive for the Day of Unity because she's human, mm-hmm. and that's why mm-hmm. Bellos was sparing her. I'll be keeping an eye on her. Like we didn't mention this, but in the first season, in the season two premiere, Lilith made a scrying potion so they could spy on the Emperor. But it's implied Bellos can see through it because the episode ends with him saying, "Knock, knock, human." But no, that is not why he wanted Luz alive. It's because they meet Philip in the past. And some demons try to steal his journal. And she and Philip get to talking about glyphs as they go on a quest. And so, yep. um, and it seems Philip is like colonial Grunkle Ford, interested in this world and about how the magic works, saying the Titan seems to be hiding itself from him, only to find out that it turns out there's a reason why he's needed in town. He has a habit of taking traveling companions and sacrificing them for no effing reason. As so, you do. And it's like, yeah, Ford never did anything as terrible as this. He was a terrible guy, but not this terrible. So they actually mm-hmm. made a character worse than Grunkle Ford. So congrats on that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But in any case, it turns out Philip lies to Lilith and Lilith that he needs their help on a quest and left them as bait for a creature called the Stone Sleeper while taking a mirror. 
unfortunately, and we get one of my favorite moments of character development when Luz remembers something Lilith taught her and goes to confront the creature, and Lilith squeaks, Ida's going to kill me. <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm thinking, wow, this is different from when you tried tossing her into a pit of spikes. That is true. But it turns out Luz does a How to Train Your Dragon and tickles the stone sleeper behind the ears, as Will has mentioned. So it lets them, it gives them a ride to Philip and confront him. And Philip reveals, I don't need this mirror for the portal, it's for something else, but you can help me with another quest. And Lilith's like, nope. Just punches him in the face. Mm-hmm. And, and then comes the and, dramatic revelation. Yep. And yeah, Luz and Lilith spend the rest of the time period studying Battle Spirits for Lilith's exhibit to, to make the trip not a total waste. And Philip cracks open a palisman and swallows it, which deforms a scar in his face. It's like, God damn it! This explains it. And we get a slight more bit period. more about the collector in this episode, but nothing yep. fully revealing yet. No. But we do get as both a hilarious and sad subplot as Ida tries mm. to avoid seeing her father. And we get a moment where she does a pretty accurate impression of Lilith while wearing her old clothes and a black mop for a wig. And Gwen kind of, her mother looks aghast as King's like, let her have this one. <laughs> but then she and her father have a serious talk. Or it's revealed she yeah. hasn't seen him because she's guilty that her the owl beast caused him to lose his eye and use of his right hand. And Cheetah asks that, he, and Dell's actually said that he wanted to help her. He never hated her for what happened or blamed her. And he was asked how she could, he could forgive her. And Dell's like, you're my daughter. Which I think is, and I'm so sad Dell didn't appear again this season. Because well, it's very insightful and philosophical. I love right and that, he, I, I also love right that, you know, this is, this comes back to how Luz felt at the very beginning of season two, where she felt guilty for what she had, for, mm -hmm. for what she thought she had done to Ida and Lilith and what they were all going through. And Ida helps her get through that moment, but Ida herself is still feeling the exact same way Luz felt, even though she helped Luz overcome these feelings in yeah. the beginning. But, but in Luz's case, it wasn't her fault because it was basically Bella's out manipulated all of them. Either. True, but it, and, it's also very much not time, Ida's fault either, in, in, in its own way, it's right? Not. So it, no, it's very, it's a very it nice totally parallel. Really yeah, I, and it is nice. And Dell also reveals he's been working with the Bat Queen to replant the palestrum trees. Mm -hmm. Shows her, and that's a nice nod to the fact that there's a palestrum wood shortage and a palestrum shortage thanks to Bellas. So we're getting hints that they're undoing the damage gradually. In the meantime, I so, guess we're moving so, on to the next episode. Yep, Hunter being a dork. Which yeah, um, that's not the name of the episode because it would fuck with the sentences that <laughs> was great. But any sport any in a storm. Sport. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, all I'll say, I just want to really say about the B plot of uh, Luz and Amity looking for that uh, autumn. I the, felt very attacked. One, it it can feel very self-attacking, but two, them just coming back and finding out that their friends have been have been playing not Quidditch with Hunter this entire time, and their reaction, brilliant. It <laughs> is. That's, that's such an awesome moment. But it uh, is a yeah, great so... moment, and also it is funny because. It's basically club day at Hexside. So Luz is trying to he's trying to start a an Azura fan club. Or rather continue mm. it, because she and Amity are the only members. When Basha comes to try and mock her, we get a great moment where Luz just ignores her making fun of the books. But Amity comes and says, there's an author visit, there's an author visit. And she's like, you, I'm still talking to you guys, but they just walk off because it's time for Mysterious Quest. Head. It was nice to see how Basha's power has broken over the school, and Amity doesn't even acknowledge her anymore. But they go on a quest to figure out if the author is Cuban or a witch, and it almost leans on the fourth wall that Dana Terrace's character, Tiny Nose, is posing as the author, running a scam with Tibbles. 
And so, and Amity quite understandably punches him with an abomination fist, which was absolutely hilarious and very deserving. And while they admit it was a total loss, it was a fun to, it was, the journey was fun. And so they're going to do a writing club, mm-hmm. which sadly has to be put on hold for the rest of the season because of, because hot. In the meantime, Darius undermines the Golden Guard's authority when he's tasked with running a meeting, taking escape, and he sends him on a snipe hunt to find recruits for the Emperor's Coven. And we know this is a snipe hunt because the Emperor's Coven is very exclusive. So he's basically telling the kid, go fuck yourself. I, uh, I love not- how, you know, <laughs> up until this point, like, they, like, even now, like, you get a slight hint, like, a, a slight view of Darius. Maybe he's not a terrible, hu- a terrible person. But you're never yeah. entirely sure. Like, they play him so well. They are. And the reveals about him are nice and gradual. Mm-hmm. So Hunter puts on a potions uniform and calls himself Caleb. To go and try and recruit people. But we already see Luz's influence. There are kids saying they want to reform the Coven system when they are older and not choose one. Mm-hmm. And then he gets on the bad side of one of the giant pets, forcing him to fly for his life which Willow notices because she's recruiting teams for Flyer Derby. So she grabs Caleb and with a vine, stands over him menacingly, and then asks, want to join our team? And, uh, <laughs> and it's like, this see. is very Willow. Yeah, and they have, yeah. they have a game, and that's kind of the end of this one, right? You, you, you know, you have Hunter finally making a few friends his own age. You see a little bit of Darius. Maybe he's not such a terrible person. Who knows? And then yeah. we move on. The next yep, episode. We move on. Yeah, and also Steve, the Emperor's Coven member who's friends with Lilith, points out to Hunter that in the Emperor's Coven, you're basically put through a Hunger Games scenario. So it's different when you have a choice versus when he basically kidnapped the friends he made. And Willow's even shocked. She can't believe it because she said the Golden Guard is your... But she said this is your... You're joking, right? Because this Caleb was a sweet, awkward guy. Mm. He didn't know what to say. And her image of the Golden Guard trying to boil her friend alive is very different. But that's interesting. The name Caleb, because Flapjack, Red Cardinal Palisman suggests it. I'm sure that's not going to come back anytime soon. It's the last, but this is... This is the, we got two more breather episodes before things get dark, so each episode has a bit of important plot. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So next yeah, we so have, reaching out. That, with that said, we have episode 14, reaching out. Yep. Uh, so, so Amity uh, goes tough, Beifong. I By think... the way, I, I like how I like how Luz just said that she's looking for distractions, and literally, at the time she needs to, Amity just walks in and it's like, eh? and it's like, Luz, we uh, uh, we have something that will distract us for the entire day. And it's like, yep, let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> I I I love personally. I think my more favorite, um. Uh, plot here is the twins to be honest especially edric because yeah. he gets the most here yeah i, I loved one where yeah. you got to see like you know how they they generally tend to wear these disguising stones to so you can't see what they really look like and then you see what they really look like and it's like man you don't need these disguising stones get out of here you're fine <laughs> yeah. but then you get to see you know edric and it's like you know man i feel like i'm useless at a lot of things and i'm not so good at a lot of things but then he helps Ida and King do everything they're doing, and he's pretty damn good at it. And it's just like, yep. man, I love the twins. Mentioned. We need more of them. <laughs> yes, I was very sad that they weren't in the final fight in the season finale, because I feel like if anyone could could help, it would be them, because they are chaos. At least they but did get their moment in the school, right? To they, a degree. Did. they definitely got their moment, but it was a shame they didn't weren't on the airship in the climax, mm-hmm. because I'm like, nope, we need the twins. We need the chaos. But maybe it would have disrupted the dynamics of the end of the season, given what happens. Mm-hmm. But in any case, in this episode, Amity wants to ditch Emperor's Coven triads to go do Enter the Bone for overall like her dad did. Alador says no and assigns her an Abomaton babysitter to make sure she goes to triads. 
So everybody goes to lose Anita for help about the brawl. And Ida's like, this is the perfect distraction and I love causing chaos. So they send the Avomaton on a snipe hunt to get a rare knife. And they go where Ida sees the Warden. Oh, the I current champion. So she creates a truth serum and Edric helps her find the ingredients, especially since she doesn't have her magic anymore. Meanwhile, Luz, as her phone keeps reminding her of an important date, tries to help Amity. And for a while it works when she points out she could join the brawl as well and eliminate her comp Amity's competition. And it actually um, seems yeah. to be working as Amity it's uses working, comp. but it's not necessarily what Amity wants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, Amity knows that Luz is hiding something, but Luz doesn't want to talk about it. So she's trying to vent out her frustrations on random witches and demons. Mm -hmm. but, but then the Abomaton comes back, it found the rare knife, and Luz accidentally breaks it. Whoops. Because of course. <laughs> and she lies to Amity that she didn't damage it, but she should, have, she should have said the truth, because just as Amity's about to win, her dad comes, stops the fight, and refuses the belt, saying, I already have one. Because when the Amadons are, de are destroyed, they send out a tracking device to him. So Amity runs away, upset at her dad and Luz, with the invisibility glyph. Yeah. And Luz decides to go find her, while Alidor is sitting, thinking about his life. That is actually a good episode for for Amity in terms of she need, because she has at least willing to give both those and out, but she also tells them, "Listen, you need to listen to me, or at least share with me stuff because yeah. I can't know." Yep. And I think, yeah. and I, again, in terms of just like Wolf said earlier communication is important and it's maybe and you know when you talk about the communication problems between Camilla and Luz you know well, you see you know throughout season one and season two here right you know Luz does have an issue of communicating with others about how she's feeling yeah. and what she's going through right. and has trouble confiding in others and part of that is the and part of that's her problem probably and, and, and you can kind of get the sense of it's because everything's luz has been through growing up and what she's been through with her mom as well and trying to be there for her mom but not willing or able to tell her mom how she really feels about things and what she would rather be doing mm -hmm. because she wants to be there for her mom and you can tell like this reflects on her as a character and it's all of season one and even season two where she continues to learn hey communicating can be helpful and you should do it and i love that that's continuously a lesson th that luz continues to have to learn that it's not something she fully grasps all the way until very close to the end right mm -hmm. yeah and that leads us to kind of to kind of think that you know i'm not sure if it was ever hinted what happened to her dad like why is her mother a single mom but it's it, it it does impact you when you found out that yeah it's something that she's living with and that there there is sadness underneath that optimism yes and what makes her feel guilty is she and her mom normally exchange flowers and it reminds her of her promise and all that and yeah. also and as someone who lost my dad we don't do an anniversary of it because that would just be too depressing mm -hmm. we often think that we we often think that there are things that you realize you don't miss and they hit you yeah. randomly uh, which is uh -huh. what loses them because she point out she lost her dad when she was just a toddler so she doesn't really remember him and so and but amity understands and they create an alternate route where amity sends an abomination balloon into the sky after reconciling with her dad with flowers that lose summons mm -hmm. with their glyph yeah. and so they make a new ritual but meanwhile camilla back on earth leaves out a flower a lily for her daughter and looks sadly at mm -hmm. the sky yeah and it's that's when that's where the episode ends we also get some interesting alador development mm -hmm. that he keeps thinking that he was not a good person, that he was irresponsible as a kid and chaotic, and he wants, and he thinks he's he by restraining that in Amity, that he's giving her 
the opportunities that he didn't have. Mm -hmm. Which is interesting, which is interesting to wrong. like, yeah, that uh, in a sense, those as uh, you know, pounds communicating have, you know, communicating have, uh, you know, that and she lost her father to Mahdi and Amity just has problems communicating with her father. And both kind of get resolved thanks to each other in a sense. So, I, I yep. suppose. And the Mighty Mittens got second place, which is pretty honorable. We find out that the Warden got demoted. After the Blabbermouth mm. spell goes wrong, Edric, Ida tells, uh, I mean, Ida tells Edric, you can always be my potions partner because I'm going to leave rich from this. But they uh, find out from the Warden that he's been demoted and that there's discourse talking about in the Emperor's Coven that no one thinks the Day of Unity is going to be the paradise that Bellas promises. And with all of that, we are moving on to episode 15. Them's the break, kid. Poor the bump. Flashback episode. <laughs> yeah, this is the flashback episode yep. where we finally learn more about Rain, and we get to see kind of how Ida and Rain met, which is really great, mm -hmm. very enjoyable. Yep. And you get to see that, you know, poor bump. He had to deal with a really terrible boss. Yeah. And Ida. <laughs> he had and to deal Ida. with Ida as a kid. I mean, that was probably my favorite scene where he tries to do the sensible thing probably that I would do. He gives her a stress toy and, <laughs> and says, that's how you stress on that when you want to do chaos. And she just casually pops it. And, and I love how face, so you see him later with multiple stress toys just squeezing the yeah. crap out of each of them. <laughs> this poor man. Yeah, but we also see that the bump was always reasonable. He's like, you have to give kids a chance to prove themselves and not make mm -hmm. them fight to the death because it could endanger them. So we see what he used to be before bureaucracy uh, caused him to become sterner. And it might explain why he likes Luz, because Luz reminded him he's in this to protect the witchlings. Mm -hmm. But in any case, because of Ida's track record, which she thought would be higher, she has to participate in a training program mm -hmm. after the principal Faust expelled the valedictorian and the grudgeby captain chewing gum too loudly and running in the halls. You know, she'll, you if she do. doesn't get a ribbon, she'll get expelled. And Ida's more upset about if this happens that she won't be with Lilith. She's already yeah. isolating herself to work in the Emperor's Coven. And we're like, and yeah, then, it's you okay. Know, she's and, not with And then it. not only that, in the, in the final competition, she's put up against Rain, who, who you know... It, is her new is her new bestie slash and it's like that you know Lisa's really going through a lot of shit like come on give her a break and right, I love how you get to Rain see friends. yeah you, you, you go. sorry go ahead you, you you just get to see more of Tara here and you see that even more she's just this really crazy horrible person like she's never been really all that good of a person and I just love that. Because you see why she would be willing really... to go along with the Emperor's Coven. Yeah, but I also think there is yeah. a lot to, to say about it. So because like it's a fun episode, it's a good one, but there isn't I mean, a lot to take out of it. I mean, the, the big thing is just, uh, you know, this is, when, yeah. Yeah, you, you get more of Rain and Ida. Is, yeah, like how they met and, you know, how that relationship started and that. Rain eventually kind of reveals to themselves, really, that and the audience that they do they do remember it. That they just uh, in hide and they they just need to hide it for yeah, like the, uh, from Bellows because obviously this is probably one of the one of if not the only episode I would say where you don't really get a lot of either of the main plot or even any potential character plots being resolved or pushed forward. Because this doesn't really do anything particular for Ida or Rain. You just learn more about them. And then you get a small bit at the very end where it's revealed that, yeah, Rain has actually been using his ability to change the taste of a drink to continue to try and fool Terra that he's not actually under her control. And you learn 
that Darius is also working with him at this point. Like you get more, you you get definitive proof yep. in the homunculus that comes to Rain and the messages that he sends him. Right. And yep. yeah, like so yeah, it like it's out... a great episode, but it's one of the few, if not the only, episode that doesn't really further anything in particular, which is fine. It's not a problem. Right. No, and it does have some interesting plot information, both mm -hmm. in the backstory and in the present, that Rain fell for Ida because she made them laugh and seemed to be the only one who didn't give a fuck about looking their best, which was true, given that skull prank, that Rain found it hilarious. Mm -hmm. And so, they both, and it could have been... And it, I mean, and it, it really was that hilarious. I just, that joke of just falling through yeah. the slime and turning into a skeleton and the slime's immediate reaction is not again. Like the fact that this <laughs> happened that <was> before. <laughs> yeah, that was great. Yeah. That was great. Yes, but we do find out something interesting. The drain, the day of unity involves the draining spell. And I'm like, are we going to go full metal alchemist here? Mm. Brotherhood. Which apparently they anime. did. Yep. I'm going to show that to you, or Seth will. One of us is going to show one that of, to you. One of the two. I know it's going <laughs> to happen at some point. Yep. Well, but meanwhile... But this is... Yeah, we're at the end of the breather episode. So now it all gets dark and sad. Yeah, so... Because now we have the next episode, Hollow Mind, which... Yeah, speaking of episodes that don't do well for the soul. Luz and Hunter get yeah. trapped inside Belos's mind. And we get to see and... more of Belos's past. Yeah. By the way, it's so side note, the episode itself doesn't really go into it. But as it turns out, people like did some analysis of the some of the pictures in the background and apparently there's this really dark and honestly tragic backstory of Bellow supposedly killing his parents just to protect his brother. Hmm. I didn't possible see because that, but if that happened them it's very like, possible uh, because I... like it, it, yeah you'd have to freeze frame it and go through all the images and everything, which is very possible. It'd be very curious to see where they go for that because we do know and we do learn in this episode that hunter is a grim walker apparently something that is created Which broke everyone's hearts and the <laughs> poor kid needs a therapy <laughs> needs a hug and a lot of he therapy needs a lot of therapy and a lot of hugs and it's especially tragic that the episode starts with Luz and hunter is bickering as hunter what? accuses Luz of getting them trapped in the emperor's mind even though it's his own damn fault he smashed the bottle of that mind potion. I mean, and she was just going to interview him. And there's a hilarious bit where she laughs at her, thinking that he gives dirt about his uncle. Mm -hmm. But then it becomes tragic as they start seeing the truth, following a, la a crying child through these memories. And at first, Hunter keeps trying to justify it, but then a mysterious voice talks about Grimwalkers. And how Bellows keeps killing them. Yeah, this is the first time we After... get to hear the collector. Yeah. And I yep. I the... love how different the collector is, right? Where it's very much yep, this cause... childlike wonder and this childlike just basically baby. You're scared, yeah. but you're also thinking this reminds us of what we thought King was gonna be. Mm. Mm-hmm. And just, but this entire episode, may, because it's in Bellos's mind and because there's a lot of uncertainty about things and stuff, it's, re I won't necessarily say uncomfortable, but it's a very, you know, it's, this, this is one of those episodes that always kind of has you on edge mm. because you're not, because everything yeah. around that is kind of, you know, you are not totally sure where it's going, and you know when you found out about Hunter and Bellas is just Bellas like really doesn't care for the kid. It's just like, oh, you know, I have a few, I had a few others like you. So if if you're, you know, if you're not gonna be, if you're not going to serve me, 
that will be odd as. I love how, you know, you get the line of, it's a shame, really, because you look the most like him. Like, I yeah. love how and they portray Bellows. I love it. Like, ah, uh, mm -hmm. me too, because Hunter is hurt and confused. And like I because said, he needs therapy. That his life is a lie. No, he needs therapy. He and Luz need to go to a friend, like a therapy group. Because mm -hmm. he just questioned, was it all a lie? And uh, Bellows tries to bury him alive in the mindscape. And that's mm -hmm. ironic that Luz. Who Luz, who's only known him for a few months, tries to save him. And that ends up saving them both because she sacrificed her jacket, which is full of all her clips. Yeah. And it's weird. It's Phil and Bellows also reveals to Luz that they met before and that he was Philip. Mm -hmm. Which and causes that, her to break completely. Yeah, that breaks her like yikes. Well, it's also because it's the only time he calls her Luz. Mm -hmm. Before it was human. Uh, and they, and, and well, like, like the other ah. like, I think like I think you should call me by my actual name. Like he knows that motherfucker knows that it's going to hotel. Like he knows exactly. Uh -huh. And we see how unstable he is because he tries to kill her for outright calling him evil, which he is. Because here's all. Because here's what we find out: Bellos is actually a human witch hunter that used talisman to extend his life. And he's mm -hmm. planning the dream spell is going to wipe out every witch and demon on the boiling isles if they received a sigil. Mm -hmm. So it's basically a genocide against a universe that did nothing to him, because yeah. he's a fucking colonial witch hunter. Mm -hmm. And. Luz says, I'm going to tell every... And Luz, like, you're evil. And he gets actually a semi-comic line, because Luz said it back in season one about Ida. Arguments of cheating in Grudgeby. Can't argue with Crazy before mm. trying to kill her. And I'm yeah, like, it's weird that... how they're both similar, but they're two opposites. Because Luz came to the <laughs> Boiling Isles and her presence has made it better immediately. Mm -hmm. And Bellos has been corrupting it. I do love how, you know, we go back to the witch hunts and witch hunters, right? Because that was something that I did not expect for Bellows to be. That definitely threw me into left field because I figured it would just be, oh, you know, he's something. Maybe he's looking for more power and stuff like that. But no, he's just, he just wants to destroy it all. That way he can f defeat the yep. quote unquote evil that he sees it as. And it's just like, yeah. wow, like that's a great villain though. Like, you yep. know, because it's just, it could have just been a power hungry villain, but no, this is a villain who he just wants to destroy this because he sees it as evil. And then the way they portray him from this point yep. forward is just so well done. Honestly, there are a lot of, yes. not, not one to one, obviously, but he has a lot of Thanos vibes hmm. that, yep. in, a, in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, let's just say that I wouldn't want to see, uh, I would want to see a poker game with these two, but from I, afar. I wouldn't be Not surprised to, yeah. if season three comes around and we find that, you know, there's more to his reasoning, whether it be something to do with his potential brother or his family in some way and how possibly demons or witches have something to do with that. Maybe they'll mm -hmm. go that route a little bit. Yep. I wouldn't be surprised if they did. That way you kind of see like, oh, there's yep. a reason there's more reasoning to his madness than just he sees it as evil. But honestly, yeah. even if they just leave it as he sees this this as evil, therefore he wants to destroy it. I'm fine with that too, because they've set the character up so well based on this episode alone and everything they else have. they've done with him. Like if he yeah. is just evil for evil's sake, that's honestly fine. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, and I think yeah, it, so, because yeah. we do need to keep going, guys. I know we can talk about this for a <laughs> yeah, while. Yeah, because yeah. yes, we could. But yeah, we got five uh, episodes to go. So, yeah, so the next episode, episode starts immediately after. Edge of the King world. dreams about meeting a family. So, fortunately, mm -hmm. Ida, with an undercover Rain's help, got the kids out of the mind. Hunters run off into the woods, and Luz is wrapped in a blanket and teeth. But she tells them what she saw, and Lilith comes after Albert informs her. Moody's mm -hmm. so happy. 
that he coughs up something, a letter, the same one from before. Yeah. And we get but to I, go meet King's people and, and find out that they're, they're not his one. people. By the, yeah. That uh, is I was like, so uh, mad by that. And not only that, I, I only now before we started, it, it reminded me, uh, this is the most random thing ever, even though it's Disney too. But the fact that all of these king people are not really king people, but they're like, he, not humans, but you know what I mean. They're just humans in, you know, in a, in, in a disguise that they're dressing up as that, but they're actually like, you know, human-like people in there, you know, like Amity and Willow and all these people. Yeah, it, they... There are people like this under all of that. I mean, and it just and it just reminded me of that episode of the Timon and Pumbaa show from the nineties, <laughs> oh, where they where they have those Indians chasing them, and there's like this little guy that keeps hitting them on the head, and then at the end they just threw the masks away, and you find out they're human, and they're like, God damn it, we didn't sign up for this. We are going back to university. <laughs> <laughs> What, oh, God. I, I'm sure they didn't yeah. plan on this, no. but like, hmm. I do. Yeah. I, so. I, I watched this episode, yeah. right? And the second, the second we get to like their place and where they're located at, and we start seeing them, and it's just these people are too nice. It, this is going way too obviously, well. What's wrong here? <laughs> something is wrong something. here. Obviously they yeah. can't, this King isn't one of them. Like that was my immediate reaction. Like, like this is just, no, too, this is too what, good. Actually, one of my favorite things is that, you know, when they, uh, when they describe to Luz and Hootie, what Titan is, and it was just that one of his, you know, trademark things is that he just he goes, suddenly Wah. goes, Wah. <laughs> yeah, that, that and the pit, uh, yeah, uh, so which, this is, yeah, and it ends up being a Chekhov gun. And then you hear the yeah. the wind. <laughs> that that you know <laughs> it just so it just so happens that the tight end is Wario from the Mario game because it goes wham. <laughs> but that, okay, okay, obviously Wario no. is a tight yeah, but... or no? Uh, you mean Waluigi? Yeah. Waluigi yeah, is no, a tight Yeah, no, Waluigi, Waluigi. Wham. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So Waluigi yeah, Titan so confirmed. Yeah, so it's revealed, and I'm so happy. I this was the only thing I got right about season two. King mm -hmm. is a titan. Not titan, as in the one in the boiling house, but his son, which which we find out later. Mm. Yeah. If he's a titan called the lost son, he was hidden away, and the titan trappers had been looking for him for years to sacrifice, because they mm -hmm. made a deal with the collector as well, under the guise of the huntsman. I love how... Fortunately, Hootie goes big yeah. Hootie protects yeah. King. And I, actually has this only insightful way, thing asking yeah, our Titan to be evil. By the way, <laughs> by the way, that just that fucking scene where Hoodie wraps himself around this thing, around the spirit to bring it down. Like, fuck, Hoodie's strong for what is basically a giant noodle. He is. And that's, <laughs> and that's why I call bullshit on something that happens in the season finale. Like, they can't oh. have him for emotion reasons. The king is left. Finding out he found out who he is, but he's not happy. And everyone's sober as the Empress Coven goes to the Owl House again. Only no Hootie to protect Oita this time. That's where we leave things. Yeah, by the way, I, I'm glad that you talked over this very unfunny idea. I just uh, spoke in Hootie's voice. Thanks for that. <laughs> Anyway, good to know. I, I do love that the main hunter person's name is Bill. Yeah, you know, and you're Again, like, mm, yeah. you know, Again, definitely reason not Pumbaa. to trust yeah. this. <laughs> well, you know, Bill, because a lot yeah. of people are going to be coming from this watching Gravity Falls and links to Bill Cipher, yeah. and you, you're immediately going to be on guard, and you have reason to be. And I love how yeah, they do reveal was, that this Bill I is also think... a little bit power hungry as well. Yeah. And yep. I, I, think that, I, I think there was also a triangle there. So oh, God. In before, there's fan <laughs> theories that this is Bill before he turns into Bill <laughs> Cypher. <laughs> well, same yep. voice. So, yeah. But um, mm -hmm. uh, so, yep. well, meanwhile, while, while this is going on, we also have episode 18. Yeah, we also have episode 18. 
Labertronels, which is pro- I assume yep. this is, the, that name is supposed to be an, epi- uh, an homage to the Maze Runner. And as an homage, it fails because it's good and the source material sucks. So <laughs> that's why. Yep. Um, yeah. All I'm going to say about the Maze Runner is that it's the only movie in my life in which, which I signed in theaters and left in the middle. I couldn't stand it. But mm. anyway, back to, so, back to good one. We get a Gus. We get an episode that focuses on Gus, Willow, um, Amity, and good. Hunter. Yep, so while good. Willow is trying to convince Amity she's not a damsel anymore, Gus mm-hmm. finds out that Hunter has been squatting in Hexide, eating garbage, and Flapjack pecks at Hunter to make him admit he's defected from the coven and didn't know where else to go. Yeah, and by so the way, Gus is like, Hunter you need actual food. And like Hunter being homeless is actually pretty depressing. <laughs> it is, because you can also see he's reading about a Grimwalker on some mm-hmm. pages, so he's trying to figure out who he is. In process, the whole his uncle tried to kill him and isn't really his uncle, which is not traumatic at all. So Gus gives him half his lunch as Bump reveals that the Illusion Coven head, Adrian Gray, is going to put fake sigils on the kids to protect them. Only, Gus notices it's a real fucking sigil, so he saves Edric from getting branded and reveals the ruse. And Gray tries to brand... Gus with an abomination sigil for busting him. Mm-hmm. Gus panics and covers the entire school in an illusion of his worst memories. And Hunter yeah. takes the opportunity to save Gus. And they uh, try to make their way through this labyrinth. Mm-hmm. And, you know, again, just uh, just a really awesome episode for Gus that, you know, his thing is, is illusions. So now he has, he yep. has an opportunity to use this power. And not only that, I like how, you know, because, you know, the episode starts with a flashback of how uh, Willow and Gus became friends because of that, uh, you know, uh, kind of because of that breeding exercise. And this actually comes back to um, to help Willow later on to, rec- to actually recognize yes. Gus and help him to it. So I really like that. That's great. Yes. And it also, because... also, be- also, not Bellos, like Hunter and Gus need to be roommates. I will pay to see that. Disney, get that spin off going. Yep. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah, and Morning Mark, the fan artist, actually did a comic showing how that might go. I and know, case... and it is amazing. <laughs> and he's amazing. All of his comics are amazing. <laughs> Even the ones that break your heart are amazing. Go follow that yeah. man. Never read the one where Waddles grows up. No, please. That no. is definitely any. But anyway, so Hunter and I actually was applauding when Hunter saves Gus because it's the first time he's he turned did. directly against Bellows. Mm-hmm. And they talk about it where Gus is in. Well, Hunter isn't quite ready to explain everything because it's a lot. But it turns out the Emperor's Coven doesn't know that Hunter ran away from. They assume the Emperor said they. The Emperor told him he was worried about his nephew and asked to bring him back to the castle to make sure he's fine. So we see they're, they're as much as victims as Hunter was, and they were lied to. And mm-hmm. Ray is basically a bad di- film director. He, yeah. When he has the Coven members disguised as got the me. students, that he gives them fun. directions, and <laughs> that was really funny. And one of them gets so frustrated that she quits and says she's going back to the tiny cat coven because she says, this year has been really bad for my self-esteem. Yeah. And we also see Bump openly turn against Bellows, protecting yeah. the kids and then leading a charge to rescue Gus. And Gray captures him to find out about the Looking Glass graveyard. Mm-hmm. So, and Bump even says the school's a haven and he lets the Emperor's Coven leave but when they threaten to tell Bellows, he's like, yeah, go, good luck telling him that you got beaten by a bunch of students. Yeah. <laughs> and Bump is like, I love it when Bump does not give a fuck anymore. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Even like, though oh, we... <laughs> uh, but the episode ends with Hunter telling everyone about the Day of Unity. And so Bump prepares to make it a sanctuary. Yeah. While letting some kids go back to their parents. Why, I don't know. But then we wouldn't have Clouds on the Horizon later. And... Um... 
one last thing to note about this one is that apparently Amity and Willow po pose like in Sailor Moon because that's a reference yep. we needed to get in there, I assume. And which well, leads yep, us to magical and, girls. And then to episode 19, Oh Titan, where at you? Um, I think out of all the yep. episodes, this is this is the one that made me go, what the fuck near the end? Most than all the episodes when we got to the lose versus uh, Ida <laughs> fight. I'm like, yeah, oh, I'm like, shit. yeah. I was like, dude, you're in the Emperor's Coven chambers. Have this fight later. Uh, Head out and then fight with Francois. Mm -hmm. After a week, uh, while Labyrinth Wonders was going on, King, King, and Luz and Hootie find out the Owl House is empty. The Emperor's Coven have confiscated stuff while I'm talking about how traumatizing Hootie's tea party was. Mm -hmm. And Lilith left a coded map to the knee, the winter area. Yeah. He does not okay Who's, with this. But, and, because... but I also love I also love Lele just kissing up to King now that he's <laughs> Yes, because Yes. Because it was yes. what King would have wanted a season ago. But no, he now doesn't. it's King's been figuring out who he is. And so it becomes one of the oddest subplots in the show, and that's saying something. He finds yeah. Steve and Empress Kevin Guard, who also is Mytholomew's brother, so which canon confirmed. Motherfucking yeah, Steve. Uh, Dude, Steve why does this character... <laughs> this should not be a character, but he is. Why? <laughs> but yeah. you also love it every moment of it, because he's just a bro. Everyone needs yeah, a Steve well, in their we life. Find out, yeah, yeah, he's also, Lilith's friend. Can we go back and... to the fact that what is it with Steve's and just being like really cool dudes all of a sudden in media? We have Steve from Stranger Things, Steve from this show now apparently, and there's been like one or two other oh, Steves uh, in other okay, shows. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, yeah. Steve from this. Troll Hunters. Okay. Hold on, I just uh, have to Steve tell you Rogers? this now. Steve Rogers too, but like I just have to tell you guys this now. There, there was this Israeli game I played once. It's a quest game where a guy tries to run to be the prime minister just to get back at people who tried to, you know, to fuck him over. And so he's attempting to be the head of a party in order so that he could run for being the prime minister. And there's the point where you go into the party's, you know, offices. And you just hear for no reason a guy go, and our new head is Steve. <laughs> and that, that's just, when you say there's always a Steve who's like the best, mm -hmm. this is my favorite Steve. The one you just <laughs> hear by name, you don't see, but then you dethrone by sheer, by, you know, by sheer, by the sheer of being an asshole <laughs> because people yep. legit chose them. So yeah, there's always a Steve, and he's always uh, the unsung yep. hero of yep. everything. <laughs> yeah, so Steve takes King on a motorcycle ride with Hootie and Lilith following, which is actually really hilarious. And, and, and then, and, and again, and then <laughs> Lilith, Lilith just flying with Hootie, who's like a helicopter, and I'm like, who decided to make Hootie a clank? Why is Hootie a clank? <laughs> So King gets the courage to tell Lilith to treat him like a person, and Steve says they could he could refer a therapist to deal with her of kissing. And it's good we have that plot, as oh. it turns out, Ida doesn't have a plan for dealing with the Day of Unity, and she knows Bellos wants King, wants Liz dead. So she offers to surrender to Rain, believing Rain was. She offers to be petrified. If Rain takes Ida and King and hides them in a bunker, Luz, over yeah. Luz overhears, whoops, and starts a fight. Which is like, mm -hmm. no timing. You can argue about this after you, because they staged a heist for, in an emperor's warehouse to get back. Before, stuff that, front before that, we should mention Ida asking Luz why can't she just go to the beach before and then Luz goes, it's not like we have 20 other adventures or something. And it's like, so, yep, there's a couple. It. There's a couple meta jokes like that in this season <laughs> that I genuinely <laughs> yep. love to death. Like, all right, I see you show writers. Yeah. I see what you're doing. Clever. I love you for it. Continue on. Yeah, but, yep. but like, I just love, I just love it now that you know that we what we'll never get a beach episode and it's like i am so it. sad it's like mm -hmm. damn disney we want a beach episode and more and more did do a funny comic about it too yeah. so we don't feel as deprived 
But when mm-hmm. the two get arrested and Nita finally admits she doesn't have a plan because they don't have magic or resources to stop the draining spell, it turns out Rain and Darius found out about the arrest and intercept their delivery to the confirmatorium. So instead, they end up in the Rebellion's hideout. And they have a plan. And Darius actually said he wanted to recruit Ida earlier, but Rain vetoed it to not endanger her. So he's mm-hmm. got his plan of track attack, but he finds the name of the Rebellion stupid. I love so how he just the hates it. Or the cat. And he's like, no, I did not agree to this. But Luz just pulls up her kitty hoodie. <laughs> like, yes. It comes it full circle. The cats. And the episode... And the episode ends where Ida and Luz start carving her palisman. By the way, so because they're over. called the, because they're called the cats, they should have just all uh, cosplay and put on a performance of the cats movie because that would terrify Bellas and he would have just quit. Why do you want to ruin it, HC? <laughs> <laughs> be, well, the, because I'm I trying mean... to be funny. Doesn't mean I, <laughs> it doesn't mean I succeed, but I was trying to be clever. No, anyway. I, it's fine. I'm yep. just giving you a hard time. Uh, I know. And I know. so here is what... And <laughs> I ever, hate you too. <laughs> to be fair, in the next episode, the cats do hiss as part of their battle cry and derives begging them don't hiss. So that's yeah. probably why. But his plan is very risky and they all acknowledge it, but it's the only one they have. They have mm-hmm. to somehow have Ida with the coven head, branded with a sigil. And that way, she will be linked into the draining spell, and her curse should destroy it. Yep. Because he remembers that it nearly killed it nearly killed him and Everwolf. So he says, it, I didn't feel anything, as Everwolf hisses at him. Mm-hmm. But Ida doesn't mention the other thing. That curse nearly killed her in Rain as well. But she says, I'll yeah. do it if it'll mean stopping the draining spell. And she refuses to let Lilith take her place, even though Lilith has a sigil. And, you know, the curse. Mm-hmm. And neither she nor Rain tell anyone that this could be a suicide mission, only saying it's good to have one last adventure. Mm-hmm. And no one brings this up that um, Lita could die if this goes right. All she yeah. does is encourage St. Luz to go rescue her girlfriend when Amity sends a distress signal on the Tamagotchi. I think, out... at this point, I think at this point it's just one of those things where if Ida would say something about this, if she would make it clear that she could very possibly die, they'll try to veto it. And... No, because Dar- and Darius probably wouldn't allow it either. Yeah. Because... So, so, so you know, you need to go you need to go with what you got and sometimes you need to be selfless. So yeah. so yeah. yeah. But, but uh, yeah. Ida says goodbye to Luz for perhaps the last time by showing off her drying talisman an egg. I, I, I see you show cute, like a tarantula. An egg. Yeah. Wink, and wink, Luz an egg. Says, and it's like, damn it. But also, yeah, this is Luz, that she wants the talisman to choose its own path or mm-hmm. what it'll be, like a daemon from his dark materials. But in the yeah. meantime, rescue mission, because Darius agrees to send the kids Luz with Gus, Willow, and Hunter as her security detail to rescue Amity, Edric, and Amira. Because Odalia grounded them for trying to talk to her and reveal yeah. the truth of the draining spell. Mm-hmm. And um... King's put on lookout, and we get one of the best scenes, but in the meantime, King's put on lookout duty. Uh, no, and... no, no, if we are going to talk about this, might as well get this into the thing. Um, yep. we, we, we have an actual on screen kiss. With Luz and Amity. And it's yep. great. And I'm willing right. to bet that uh, Damateris just told the Disney animators I need a bit uh, a bit more of a budget for a fight scene. Just yep. trust me on this. Because the animation is like becoming super smooth in that moment. Mm. Yep. Just for Amity that moment. Spins around Luz and kisses her. And mm-hmm. but before they go, like the plan was just they get in and get out with the twins and Amity. But Amity says, We need to talk to my dad and tell him. And so against their better judgment, they go to try and sneak into the coven. But mm-hmm. they get busted. Because guess yeah. what? Hunter's voice is still annoying to Kikimura. Yeah, and that's she just eyed. <laughs> I was like, damn it, Hunter. The fact that that's a plot <laughs> point which was brought back. <laughs> Kudos, yes. man. Claps. Claps. Yep. I and love so how they use Odal- stuff. <laughs> yeah, and Odalia plans to hand over the kids minus Amity to the coven because Luz is, is right now 
the Emperor's most wanted. Mm-hmm. And she said, and when she finds out they're dating, she's like, oh no, I'm gonna find you a better girlfriend. Okay. And Andy gets so by, mad. By the way, by the way, I'm not saying that they should have done that, right? I'm not saying it's good that they just treat it as a normal thing. And yeah, I love I'm it. So but, glad they did. But like, but it's also like, oh, Dahlia. Honest, uh, uh, no, but let's be honest. Is Dahlia one of those assholes who would be homophobic and be like, no, I'm getting you a guy. Like, I like get out with this nonsense. I'm glad they didn't, but like, this bitch would say something like that, let's be honest. Uh, yeah, but I love how Amity then starts breaking their prison, and she at first yeah. thinks, I did I do it with the power of belief? But her dad mm. comes with King. Uh, yeah. They're both thinking it was science. Uh, cannot, but you almost had it, sweetie. <laughs> and it's like, uh, Alador, uh, this one's up Alador. <laughs> and I like it that it seems like some of the books and just stuff that uh, Luz gave Amity to read kind of inspired her, like, was this like the power of my belief? Was this it? And it's like, no, it's not really that. But, but you did, you almost had it. But meanwhile, King can told Alador about the Day of Unity. And I was like, nope, I am not letting innocent witches die for my mm-hmm. benefit. I, so I do love how died. it's King that just, you know, him and just Alador, like he's supposed to be on guard duty or watch out duty. And it's just him and Alador just chatting up and just having a good old time yep. eating. And just kind of wallowing yeah. in their yep. misery a little bit, but then like, yeah, no, we can do this. Let's go do something. And it's just... Well, King ended up saving the day just with mm-hmm. his big heart, which he mm-hmm. learned from Luz. So it all comes back to how Luz's kindness is an influence. During the fight, Kikimori goes for Hunter, or who she thinks is Hunter. I mean, she fails enough that Hunter doesn't know what a blowing a raspberry is, sticking out your tongue. Turns mm-hmm. out, Gus, realizing that probably Luz, Bellas would probably just kill Luz, but he might use Hunter to make a new Grimwalker. Luz convinces mm-hmm. Gus to cast illusions that allow them to switch places. So Luz mm-hmm. has been captured and taken to Bellas. So the kids, yeah. plus Alador as a pilot, go on a rescue mission to face Bellas mm-hmm. and Hunter. And Hunter especially guilty because he didn't agree to this plan. And he's still traumatized. And, fa- and this leads us to the season finale. King's yep. Tide. Um, and a callback to separate tides. So, mm-hmm. um, so the day of... So, so, the day, so the day of unity is happening and fuck it up basically almost dies. Kinda. Yep. Nearly and, everyone dies. And because. then and then Bella stones on the on the collector which bad idea and yep. then and then he has a little fight with Luz, which by the way, way loses move of hiding the, that uh, neutralizing glove with a with an invisibility glyph like brilliant move. like it was a great move, move because yeah. and it ultimately showed that the problem is bellows plan for every contingency he told Luz she's better but he's got 400 years of experience on her and proves it so this mm-hmm. isn't something a child prodigy can fight. And it turns yeah. out Tara figured out Rain might have not been brainwashed. And mm-hmm. Russ Ida in disguise when seeing that the spell isn't working. And what's upsetting is Darius's plan almost worked. It would have yeah. saved everyone. But because of fucking Tara, who thinks they're getting paradise. Yeah. It. And that- when it starts, and she only realizes after it starts that they have been done, the cake is a lie. They've been screwed mm-hmm. over. And for the only time she calls the real Rain by their name, Mm -hmm. asking if Bellas will give them what they are promised, and all Rain can do, with a very slow, I told you so, look, shakes their head. But Rain uses their last moments to save Ida by ripping off her hand, a Chekhov's gun from the pilot that saves Ida, but she gives up. But she gives Mm -hmm. up because Rain is dying in front of her, and so she stays to comfort them. And Luz cries... So the kids go against Bellows when he's become a one-winged angel, and King <laughs> allies with King and Morris winged, got fired. One-winged angel is not what I would call this thing. An abomination is more like it, but okay. Well, basically, it's I will not turn into a giant snake. It won't end well. <laughs> but he does kick the kids' butts despite their best effort and Hunter fighting the draining spell. So yeah. he's lasting longer than the witches. But Kikimura takes King to the Collector to, de- to-, to get back at Bellas. I love how it's, it's Kikimura at the very end. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And she just lasts the longest of the witches out of spite. <laughs> yeah. Because she wants to see Bellas defeated. 
And it turns out the collector is a child. And, and King, agrees to a I love how swear if even King will teach him owl house. Even King's them them. symbol at the very end on his collar comes yeah, back into play and for, has yeah, an effect, right? Yeah. Where the collector knows someone's there but can't see him because of that symbol for whatever reason. And I love yeah. how that continues to play a part. And that's just another question that you have in yeah. terms of what are the Titans and the collector and what is their connection here? But we finally see yep. the collector because King releases him and we truly see. You know, and, and you even hear, like, at the very end, Kikimura tells King that Bellos is afraid of the Collector. Why? Yeah, I don't know. As he's, but he's as afraid well, of him. As well, we find out why. Mm, very quickly, too, that the Collector just yep. instantly destroys Bellos and just says, okay, you want me to end the spell? Who, boop, let me move the sun. Done. Yeah, that, <laughs> yeah, that, that was just... Um, so just because we can't need to wrap things up here, mm. so <clears throat> let's just... Uh, Basically, the, it, the collector saves everyone on the Boiling Isles to play that game Owl House, which the kids mm -hmm. claim is a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. But they realize they And Hunter play. gives the best review of Shrug, I guess. Squeak. And, 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 <laughs> no, he gives like a little terrified squeak. Because mm -hmm. yeah. he's dying. And after, and he's dying, know, and, after that, and he just saw his uncle being turned to sashimi. Basically turned yeah. to goop. And he tweets a little... Yeah, and then uh, I'll, uh, and then you know when they are escaping to the portal, though he gets a bit, a of, bit that of that group on him. falls on his shoulder. Yeah, yeah. because and and, then... and Addy tells Luz they can't stay and rescue everyone. Yeah, even Luz agrees Which... to send her friends through the portal and stay behind to make sure it stabilizes before finding Ida. But then and King, King tells... pulls the, uh, the, the King sacrifice. Says sacrifice. That Luz can't make. Yes, he says he's going to. Play with the collector per their deal. Collector yeah. oddly enough lets him go. He lets the kids go. He demands only kids. King stays for their deal. The king mm -hmm. sends Luz and the other through the portal, giving his sonic scream, and, and it's uh, damage beyond repair again. Yeah, so they can only do one thing. Gus mm -hmm. cries, and they go and, home. And well, they go to they go through the door to Luz's world, and she takes them home. Oh. And this is where our season ends. And now we come to season three, where we're only going to get three 45-minute episodes, and we have found out mm -hmm. that the series has been canceled by, by way, Disney. By the way, yep. we'll, we will start the thing was actually canceled. Yeah, I came to... So, to our audience, right? I, my understanding was this was it. You know, that we're not getting anything else after this. I was so pissed off by that. Like, this is how we're ending Owl House. Because Disney is just... That someone in power, in charge at Disney, is so stupid. I was pissed. And then HC cleared things up for me, I will admit. Where, no, 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 we're getting a season three. It's just going to be three episodes. And it's like, all right, I'm still angry with you, Disney. Just marginally less so. That we at least hopefully get some sort of ending. But it's so annoying, right? And I, I think it we, we, it deserves to at least be gone through a little bit. Disney's reasoning for canceling the show, like it's so annoying because we've been told by Dana Terrace that you no, know, it wasn't any it wasn't anything particular in, in regards to the LGBTQ plus representation. It was solely that s someone or a group of people at Disney felt like the Owl House did not agree with their brand and that it skewed too old for either Disney or the Disney Channel. And I just... Two worlds bullshit. Yeah, I cannot wrap my head around that because I look at all the stuff that is currently airing on the Disney Channel and has aired on the Disney Channel in the past, and I just... And then even looking at Disney itself and how their audience tends to skew. Like, Disney, you might want By to be... By the way, be... Wolf, before, before you continue, I just want to say that, uh, Jay, if you need to go for the thing, then... Mm -hmm. We need to go, and but, and, but since we, thank you so much. we'll curse, we'll yeah, curse but, Disney for you. I promise, yeah. I will. <laughs> curse Disney for me. Uh, but uh, yeah, just to, uh, let's, just, let's just say together, Ryan the Last Dragon sucks. There. <laughs> okay, one, two, three. three. Ryan, Ryan the, the last, last Dragon sucks. There we go. Okay, uh, <laughs> thanks for joining, and uh, we'll we'll link uh, everything that you that uh, people need to find you in the description, mm -hmm. as usual. Thank you. Okay. Talk soon.
Bye bye. Okay. So anyway, it, back I just, to I have to rant about Disney because it just blows my mind that they would cancel this show and say that it 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 skews too old for us and it skews too old for even if you want to be specific, it skews too old for the Disney Channel. Because again, I look yeah. at stuff that has aired on there in the past and that is currently airing on there. The way I understand Amphibia, it's not much different than the Owl House. It's not, and like, uh, let's say that Amphibia actually had in the season two finale without giving anything away to those who haven't seen it. It actually starts with a message of like, some scenes here may be a bit too violent for young kids. So, you know, your discussion is advised and it's like, yeah, you are you are going to give that a full thirty zen, but not the but not the Owl House. And I, in a sense, I will say that in a lot of ways, the Owl House is a bit more. Yeah, I can absolutely say like the Owl House. A, yeah, I can look at the Owl House and say, yeah, I can understand that this show skews more towards an older audience than what other Disney Channel stuff might. Like, yeah, I can look at it and say, yes, the Owl House skew is older. Absolutely. How is that a problem for you, Disney? Because yeah, that has the been your is, brand for a long time. Like, yeah, whether, I like, I have to imagine someone in charge or a group of people in charge at Disney just do not understand their own brand because Disney has always been seen by so many people as this thing that it's not just for kids. Yes. Yeah. Your biggest audience probably is kids, and you want that to continue to be the case. But your audience has been always more than that. Your audience has always skewed older anyways, because that is who you are. You appeal to everything, to everyone. With and that, I firmly, uh, and maybe I'm wrong at this and I'm misquoting or I'm misremembering, but I feel like there's a quote by, Disney, by, by Walt Disney himself where he says, like, you know, where he says something along the lines of, I want... He may, yeah, but like he makes movies for adults and uh, like not yeah, he for wants kids, his stuff but... to appeal to everyone, right? Like he wants his yeah. thing. He he wants the things he makes to appeal to and everyone of all know, generations and ages. There's... I and feel like that's a thing, but maybe I'm wrong. Say that, yeah, but there's also this thing where keep in mind when you talk about Disney, you don't necessarily think about the Disney Channel stuff, like mm -hmm. uh, because. You mostly think about the feature films, mm -hmm. and I'd say you know, like the, I guess, debating on what on what kind of thing you're looking at here, because I'll say, let's say what what's the highest ghost in Disney movie at the at the I, time of this? I recording? think it's Lion King For, still. No, 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 it's Frozen. Oh, it, it's yeah, Frozen but, too. Yeah. Yeah, of course, it's frozen, it's frozen fucking frozen. Uh, but uh, okay, um, but the thing is, and regardless of what you think about Frozen Two no, or the think. original or even or even Lion King, you can't tell me that the Owl House is more, you know, is more adult than those because, like, I'm not going to pretend that Frozen is something that's super dark or adult no. or anything. But at the same time, you know, it's still you. You look at Frozen 2, for example, and there are some scenes there and some stuff that's like, yeah, no, you are, I think you are asking kids, you are, you are asking a lot out of kids. And, and well, no, you know, they're again, not. You, they're not, though, and, because kids are genuinely really smart and they get these things and they no, understand no, no, this no, stuff. What I, mean, what I mean by that is that you can't really say that the Yellow House is out of the Disney brand. When okay. your most, when your highest grossing movie and arguably, arguably your mo your one of your most popular franchises in general, it went to those heights, mm. went That's to fair. those places. Very fair. You can you can you can tell you can tell me this is a you know there's a difference here. Mm -hmm. If 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 the only thing is that because the our house is you know talking about you know it's talking about witchcraft, which a lot of people ban and stuff. They, well, you know, Harry Potter, uh, you know, Harry Potter is not that, uh, you know, it's not banned. In, actually, no, it is. Yeah, I mean, it point depends is, on who you talk to. But... Yeah, but but point, is, but point is, again, it's not, it feels self-contradictory. Well, saying. I mean, even then, right, like the quote unquote ban on Harry Potter that you had here or there by some parents and some people, right? It just, okay. it assumes kids are stupid. It assumes that, oh, kids don't get it. And it's like, we have so much proof 
everywhere that kids do get it and it's like i just wish people would see this because kids do understand it they do get it they are very fucking smart surprisingly too smart for yeah. their own damn good sometimes fuck you kids <laughs> old man yells off of his lawn and porch <clears throat> But no, genuinely, it just it feels so disingenuous coming from Disney, the people who actively make stuff that genuinely, more often than not, does respect that intelligence that kids have. And that is how they became who they are, because they respected the intelligence that kids do have. And they understood that kids are genuinely really smart and they can get and understand this stuff and they can separate it. Absolutely. Sometimes you need to be the parent. You, you, you know, you need to have the parent there and you need to be the parent who's there to like say, well, here's the differences here. Here's where you can disconnect and see these things differently and understand them differently. And you need to be willing yeah. to, ex and, and you need to be as a parent willing to sit there and explain that to your kids. Right. Mm -hmm. And, but, but Disney has always put forward, even in their movies, even in their own personal movies that they'd make, like looking back at the Lion King, like the themes of the Lion King, probably one of before Frozen, you know, the best and highest grossing Disney movie and most critically acclaimed Disney movie ever had a lot of themes that, you know, this is really dark for kids, but it portrayed it in a way and it showed it in a way that kids would be able to understand. And the fact and that there's someone at Disney who is in power who or a group of people at Disney who are have the ability to make executive choices when it comes to shows and potentially other things as well, saying that this skews too old for us. We can't continue to show it because it doesn't work for us or our brand tells me as an outsider that there's someone over there who does not understand what Disney is and why it has gotten to the place that it has. It tells me that there is an absolute idiot over there working who does not deserve their position or the money they're making from that position. And it saddens and me because note, you own Marvel, you own Star Wars, you own Pixar, the company, the animation company that is built around making animated movies that appeal to both adults and kids. Mm -hmm. And it's just, what is my hope here if you have people over at that company who make stupid decisions like this and cannot think for themselves? at all or understand and, their own company and you and you say all of that and just, it, it, this is this is kind of a you know this is kind of a cynical point to bring up but you mentioned lion king they have disney junior which has the lion god and that show where the freaking elephant dead elephant body on screen in one episode like you can tell me that this is okay with the Disney brand, but nothing in the all houses. Yeah, I mean, no. I just it, it. I firmly believe this was the reasoning they gave, and I firmly believe that someone does believe it that is. that you know they feel that this show skews too old and that it doesn't fit our brand. I firmly believe someone at Disney feels that way, and that's why the show is canceled. Because I feel if it was anything else. Dana Terrace isn't an idiot. She would have figured it out and she would be very against if it was anything yeah. else, right? I feel like considering the things she's already called Disney out for and been against Disney for, still working for them even, I feel like she would have called them out on it. She would have said something. something she would have made it very clear and very public. Me, I, I don't want to say, to assume anything. I'm not, to, and I'm not, take everything as I would a grain of salt. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a, Absolutely. But, uh, something tells me, though, that maybe, maybe she's doing anything. She, she's saying she's saying and doing anything she can out of some sort of contractual obligation. I don't think so. Because, because again, and, and, no, everything. Hear me out. Hear me out. Hear me out. Because the thing she did call Disney out for, uh, like uh, at least, is you know when when they did the. How do you do it? When, when uh, you know, when uh, you know, when Disney, you know, supported that uh, homophobic bill, oh, for yeah. example, in yeah. Florida, she called them out on that. But mm -hmm. notice that she doesn't necessarily call them out on on anything regarding the like. She does say, oh, you know, she does say here and there that she, you know, that she did this fight and stood for some of the things she believes in. Mm -hmm. But whenever it comes to the Owl House, she does seem a bit more defensive about it. 
And I'm not trying to say anything here. I don't know. I could be mm-hmm. wrong. But I think the but I think because it's her show and everything she says regarding the production of it could be dangerous at this point, as long as they're still making the show. I have a feeling she's probably just trying to keep the cards the cards close to her chest for the time being. It could be. I think. You know, I mean, you absolutely think... could be right, and that the reason the show was canceled was because someone or a group of people in charge at Disney just hated the LGBTQ representation of the show. It very well could be that. I'm personally willing to believe Dana in the fact that she says that that's not the reason. I firmly believe that, you know, if it was, she would say something irregardless of her position on the show and her willingness and want to protect it to some degree. I feel like she would still say something irregardless, even if it might mean that she's taken off of it. I feel like she would say something yeah. personally. I could be wrong. I could be, you know, she still wants and to try and finish the show and again, what she can. Record, this is us. Uh, this, this is, is all speculation and assumption. Just, uh, speculating. Huge grain of salt. And... Yeah, like uh, for the uh, for the record here, it, on the off chance that Terrace is watching this, for the one, uh, for, for one, you're a genius, mm. <laughs> and and two, this is, we are not trying to put words in your mouth. No. We don't know what's actually going on. We're Again, like we don't know the relationships theory. of anything and what's going on there. We can only assume from the outside in, but from the outside, it just it's hard to wrap your head around the choice of and the statement of it it skews too old it doesn't represent our brand whether you take it specifically to mean the disney channel itself or disney as a whole it just doesn't fit with how so many people view disney and it's hard to wrap your head around it and you have to assume that someone over there is just an absolute idiot or a group of people over there are an absolute idiot or absolute idiots and this is a group of people or a, or a particular person that has a, some executive power within the company. And that's just such a problem considering what I would argue the company has met, has, has met, has meant to a lot of bleh, has meant to a lot of people for quite some time. And that is a company that doesn't just skew for children, that doesn't just, you know, appeal to children, but appeals to anyone and everyone of all ages. From any generation and i feel like yeah at one point in time disney might have been you know this is the company for children they make stuff for children but i don't feel that's been the case for a long time now and i do feel that because that hasn't been the case that's where disney's popularity and you know surge of popularity and why they are such a powerful company now came from the fact that they've never truly skewed for children that they've always skewed for all ages, whether yes. they want to or not. <clears throat> and so again, so that, that's just, that's, uh, it's sorry. It's just, just got to end. Uh, I would personally, I would hope that it honestly is someone's just an asshole over at Disney and they just hate the LGBTQ, the LGBTQ representation because that's at least more understandable than the reason we've been given thus far you can at least wrap your head around that and say okay someone's just an asshole fair enough i still don't agree with it you're an asshole but at least i can understand that this i just can't because again it just tells me that someone doesn't get it and that is a problem yep but moving on we do get a season three at least we do get to see this show end which i'm at least thankful for and i do hope that with the time they've been given and looking at season two i do think these writers can at least pull off something that is very tightly focused and gives everyone the answers that to a general sense of what they're looking for and at least while it's not going to be their full creative vision and what they truly wanted to make it's at least going to be something that i hope everyone can be to some degree happy with in terms of how it concludes things amen with that said this is all for this episode of the outcast we hope you enjoyed we talked a lot in this one it's been what a while since outcast? we've had a long episode so enjoy <laughs> yeah uh what are your thoughts about um, about the Owl house season two what are what are you thinking about the reason for its cancellation and uh, you know what do you think season three is going to hold in store for us 
You can tell us all about it in the comment section below on our Twitter, which is Belcast with a capital B, capital C, and um, on our Tumblr, which is Belcast Team. Uh, links to Jaya's ways of communication, if you want to find her, it will be posted in the description mm -hmm. below, including her full recap of season two of The Owl House. We'll link that as well. Until we'll next find time, it, but yeah, we'll definitely try and have that in there if I can. She'll she'll link it to us <laughs> most likely. Sure. So until next time, I was HC. I was Wolf. And we will talk to you all next time. Take care. Bye bye.